Yes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular council meeting for the afternoon of September the 14th. This meeting is being recorded live and is streaming on the District of Summerland YouTube channel at youtube.com, District of Summerland. All representations to council, written or verbal, will form part of the public record and be available to the public for viewing electronically or as a written record. Members of the public are encouraged to register their name and civic address in advance of the meeting for the public comment opportunity found under items 6 and 8, or by email to corporateofficer at summerland.ca. Those who have not registered in advance may call 250-404-4052 during the live meeting to be added to the speakers list. Welcome back, corporate officer. Uh, are there any late items to introduce? Thank you. Um, so could I call for approval of the agenda then, please? Councillor Van Olfen, Councillor Trainer, all in favor? Thank you. And adoption of the minutes of August the 24th, regular afternoon meeting. Any changes in there? Okay, Councillor Barkwell and Councillor Van Elfen. All in favor? Thank you, that's approved. And then right on to delegations. 5.1, the first of two delegations. Uh, art Walks, Art Chairs Project, uh, being presented by Dr. Sharon McCubre, who is the chairperson of Lake Country Art Walk 2020. And I believe you are on the line. Yes, I am. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity to um, speak to the proposal that we sent to uh, Summerland a little while ago. Um, I'm going to maybe just give a few highlights of the project and the invitation and, and, um, then, and hope to answer any questions or get any clarification. That sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have had a multi-art festival in Lake Country for 26 years. This would have been our 27th year. It's um, a, a large show and many artists up and down the entire valley are supported at this festival and, and many, many visitors come from up and down the valley and beyond. So when, when COVID shut down, prevented us from having our regular festival this year, we wanted to have some way to mark the 2020 year and still be able to support artists and still be able to offer some art to the, the public. And we actually um, settled on the project of doing painted chairs. The chairs are the scope and style, they're kind of comfortable and uh, well known and kind of imply a little bit of come and sit and rest and visit. So we commissioned 45 artists to paint 45 chairs and now what we are doing is offering them at no cost to most of the municipalities up and down the Okanagan Valley to be installed at a location of your choice. Um, we're looking at this as an approximately a two-year project, which means it's sort of a temporary public art installation. Uh, that's around the amount of time that we can consider the, the chair to stay fresh and, and uh, look good in the community. Um, and so we have three chairs ready to go. Uh, within some nine municipality, if you were to choose to accept this invitation, and uh, we can start through more details about location. Each artist was asked to include a positive statement uh, that is just to add to the uplifting experience that we were trying to offer with these, this chair project, and uh, in, a, in a time when probably most people would be happy to be uh, triggered with a positive thought. So that's the essence of the project, and so we were just um, hoping that Summerland Life might choose to participate in the project. Thank you very much. Council, do you have any questions of Dr. McCoubrey? All right. Um, I don't see any uh, resolutions, at least in my copy of the agenda. 
So if we receive this for, this for information, should we also, or would you like us also to include um, a resolution that uh, accepts or does not of this project, the three chairs? Yeah, uh, through Chair Madam Mayor, I think it would be good to, if Council is supportive of this initiative, direct it to staff and we'll work with our uh, Director of uh, Community Recreation to make sure that we bring this back to Council with the appropriate location as well for Council's review. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carlson. I will move that as a motion. And thank you. Seconder. Councillor Trainer. Yes, speak to us. This council need to decide where these um, chairs go. It's only three that it's temporary, so could we possibly leave that to staff to do just to get it going yes. a bit quicker? Yeah, yeah. Uh, through Chairman, and then we'll bring a report back to council to see how that information Okay, good. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? And none of those. Thank you. Good, thank you so much for your presentation this morning and staff will be in contact with you, um, Jen. That's wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Now on to our second delegation, 5.2, invasive weed, um, specifically the Horealism. And Lisa Scott is here, who is the executive director of the Okanagan and Sinopini Invasive Species Society. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you for inviting me here today, um, um, Mayor Booch, and Council, and staff. Um, so I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I'll be going through this afternoon. Um, so as, um, as Mayor Booch noted, the focus is on uh, Horealism, and this is in response to a request that came to me um, from Council following a uh, meeting uh, earlier in August where this was discussed. Um, as was noted, I'm the executive director of OASIS, the Okanagan and Sonoma Invasive Species Society. For anyone not familiar who we are, that's what this slide is about. Um, we are a nonprofit society. We are in our 24th year. We're one of the longest running invasive uh, species society in British Columbia. Um, our boundaries are the regional district of Okanagan, Sinalkameen, with our office housed right here in Summerland, happens to be my house. Um, we are a diverse cross section, or have a diverse cross section of, of members as well as funders. Um, and the way we uh, deal with invasive species is looking at their pathways of spread um, and looking at how to um, prioritize because there's never enough funds for when it comes to invasive species. So a big part of what we do is prioritization. And we do that with multiple uh, stakeholders who work cooperatively throughout the year. Our organization is responsible for all phases of invasive species management, right from um, the, the planning and securing grants and other finances um, through to um, coordinating, implementing, and making it all happen, evaluating um, the work that we do, uh, and either doing the treatment ourselves or, or bringing in uh, contractors to do the work. Um, we are an invasive species society, but we are largely still invasive plants. Um, in addition to the on-the-ground work that we do, we're also involved in public information programs and community stewardship. And as noted very importantly in the last bullet, we, we have for quite some time worked very closely with the, the District of Summerland. Um, specifically, I work with um, Martin Stan through Public Works, <coughs> and we provide um, assistance through our, our summer staff and then advice as needed from staff throughout the year. So on to our focal species. So um, Horealism, anyone not familiar with it? Um, I do have some samples here and I can um, leave these for you to look at. Um, it's, um, it's an interesting plant. It has a lot of variations in its life form. Uh, typically thought of as an annual, but it can also grow as a biennial or um, even a short-lived perennial. 
It reaches heights of up to uh, just over a meter tall, and it has distinctive uh, white flowers with deeply notched petals. It's actually a mustard species. We typically think of mustards as being like the, the yellow canola, but this is one of our white mustard species. Uh, it's a tap-rooted plant, um, and it only spreads by seeds. It, it typically has branch stems and greenish-gray leaves, and the lower stem tends to be purplish. And uh, when it goes to seed, as it is at this time of year, it has flattened oval seed pods that are distinctive. You'll hopefully recognize most of the images um, throughout this presentation, which we're taking throughout the district. Um, where where you listen grows, it tends to be uh, dry, sandy, or gravelly soils. It really does well on our roadsides um, and other dry, disturbed habitats, or with some irrigation, so pastures, hay fields, um, rangelands, or embankments. And fortunately, this photo is not Summerland. This is Grand Forks. I took this actually in 2005. This is what it can do. Um, it can form very dense infestations uh, that essentially um, render land unusable. Um, so significantly, can significantly devalue the land, especially uh, those lands used for agriculture. And this um, reason is I on this slide is why I believe it was brought to council attention is its toxicity. So it, um, this particular um, species of weed is um, toxic to horses, not um, ruminants like cattle, sheep, goats. They seem to be able to um, feed on it unharmed. But horses, uh, either when they graze the plant fresh in the pasture or if they eat it in contaminated hay, this is when um, they can um, show symptoms of poisoning and in the worst case scenario actually um, die from consumption. Um, when it comes to control options for Horeolissum, it's not too dissimilar from a lot of other invasive plants. Um, prevention is always, always the number one approach. If you don't have it, take steps so you don't get it on your property. So when, that, when we're talking about agricultural fields, uh, that means maintaining healthy dead stands of pasture forages. Um, this will provide that competitive advantage to um, prevent the growth or the spread of Coriolisum. Um, when infestations do take hold, um, small infestations can be controlled by hand pulling or digging. Um, mowing can set back plants, they'll prevent seed production, it's not super effective, um, but all of these techniques need to be done um, before um, seed or during flower when it's a little bit more obvious. Uh, and then another option is um, herbicide spot treatment. Generally, though, what I would say, just again, like any invasive plant management, it's an integrated approach, so it all depends on where the plant is growing, um, how bad the infestation is, but taking a multi-pronged approach. So when this was brought to my attention in August, um, I saw an opportunity, we still had summer students, and as I say, we do uh, work closely with the district. Um, I had a conversation um, um, with Martin at Public Works, and I put my summer students to work on the task of doing roadside surveys. So they, um, uh, two students, dedicated three full days in August to this task. Um, so you know, keeping in mind, Time of year was not ideal. Plants, uh, some plants had been mowed, or some roadsides had already been mowed or treated by other means. Um, and plants start to senesce once you get into late summer. But nonetheless, the it was, is now in lecture mode. Nonetheless, it was still um, blooming in a lot of areas, so it, it gave us some base information. So I had them go to some key locations, including Prairie Valley, Dale Meadows, Garnet Valley. Canyon View Road, Happy Valley Road, so the agricultural areas, um, also the industrial area, um, the KBR station parking lot, the Summerland Rodeo Grounds parking lot, 
uh, as well as the Summerland Landfill and the Ministry of Transportation uh, gravel pit. Um, when they noted um, infestations of Corydalisum on private land, they um, made a notation so that we could be in touch with those private landowners and educate them in future years or possibly even this fall. So the results, um, they uh, traveled on um, 74 roads, total about 100 kilometers. I was pretty um, pleased with uh, the amount of coverage they got. Um, and they found that 52% of the roads had realism. And typically, it was the small side roads that lacked the Borealism. And the areas with the greatest infestation were Dale Meadows Road, Simpson Road, particularly near the train tracks, uh, Curry Valley Road, Mountain Avenue, uh, the North End of Garnet Valley Road near the Cabin Garden. So where do we go from here? Um, so my recommendation would be to develop a long-term multi-stakeholder management plan. These invasive plants did not get here overnight and there's not going to be a quick fix. And um, I don't think we need to point fingers at um, any one particular group, um, whether it's the fingers being pointed at the district or private landowners. Um, everybody needs to take responsibility here and work together cooperatively. Um, this should focus on areas of highest risk, so we're looking at the agricultural areas, especially where we have pastures and hay fields. Um, and it needs to include preventative actions as well as best management practices. Uh, I would recommend that some more timely survey work be, be conducted, especially in our gravel pits. Um, gravel pits are a very major source of um, uh, invasive plant seeds. Um, typically, um, invasive plant seeds are in that gravel, and then if you think of what we do in the wintertime, spreading gravel on our roadways and, and unknowingly um, spreading seeds throughout the district. So I think that's an area that we should really target and look at more carefully. And then, as I mentioned already, um, contact should be made with private landowners where they um, uh, have agricultural land, hay fields, and pastures, um, and information provided to them about the concern and what they can do about it. So again, I repeat, everybody needs to take responsibility. Having said this, my final point, I don't think we should just go out and put a whole bunch of effort into a single species. Um, I'm a professional biologist. I do work on invasive species, but I also do work on species at risk. And um, whether you're talking about invasive species or species at risk, your best bang for buck is taking a landscape approach, a multi-species approach, and um, you'll get the greatest effort. So again, I just, a couple images here um, where uh, Corey Lissom was found, Mountain Avenue, Simpson Road, and it's growing alongside baby's breath, kochia, Russian thistle, nappy, burdock, puncture vine. Um, we have invasive plant issues in the district. Um, we're no different from any other community, though. Uh, but it, I think we need to take that multi-species, multi-agency, long-term approach um, for the best results. Thank you for your time, and of course I'm available for questions. And um, in addition to the plant sample, I do have a little booklet for everyone that's um, new this year. It's a regional uh, guide to identifying invasive plants and weeds, but um, there's enough for um, all council members and staff. And I have thousands more. At home. Questions? Councillor Van Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. My phone rang off the wall when I brought this up. I had photos sent from Lavington, from Grand Forest, where fields were covered in this flower. Um, a veterinarian phoned me from Penticton, you know, and thanked me, thanked Council for bringing it up because it's a fight that he's been fighting for years with uh, different ministries. 
Um, I like what you said. You know, it, it, I'm not. I'm not for one moment suggesting this is all the municipality's problem. It's my problem too. You know, it's uh, it's in a ditch um, with one of the fields I lease, and if I don't do something about it, it'll be in the in the hay field eventually. Um, but it is, you know, I learned a lot about it, and even in Summerland, if you look in some certain areas, Prairie Valley is one really good instance. It seems more prevalent in corners where the sand truck may distribute more sand on an intersection, so to speak. Um, I did have a conversation with Mr. Stam. Uh, even on Garnet Valley for years, we had very little, um, lots of the other invasive bush weed, but we had, it's just slipping my mind, we had very little of it until the road construction project. And once the road construction project was over, not weed, sorry, um, now it's, it's just abundant again. But it's just from transporting gravels from one area to the other. So I think, you know, it's just, I'm grateful that it's been brought to the attention at this stage. And then possibly, you know, individuals can eradicate it themselves by digging it up or spraying it or what have you. But do you know what? Um, herbicide works best. Is it a 2,4-D product? Um, there's different products that are effective. There are some choices, and it really depends on um, the land and the um, long-term objectives for the property, whether it's pasture land, whether it's irrigated, whether it's roadside. So we'd have to look at that on a side-by-side basis. Okay, thank you. And then the, another location that I found, we were at the grand opening of the second phase of Giants Head Park, first and second, and across the street from the parking area. There's a boulevard there, and it was just quite prevalent there. So, I mean, if we're not careful, it'll end up in places we don't want to see it. So, But thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Any other questions? Councilor Barkley. <clears throat> I was wondering, um, I see that I mean, I thank Councillor Van Alpen for bringing this forward. And um, certainly, we're not just thinking about this one plan. It, it, uh, it's just sort of like um, brought it all to the surface. And I, I sort of was wondering what your sources of funding are, and if there's anything more in Summerland that you can make suggestions to us that we could do. Is that really, as I was saying earlier, yes, I, um, I really would like to see us put in much as we can now in order to prevent spending money later when, you know, once it's, it, you know, the, uh, it's growing everywhere and the problem's gotten much worse. Stitching time saves nine. Um, thanks for your question. Um, our, our funding sources, typically we receive um, funding from at least 20 sources. Um, it's very piecemeal, but it's, it's what we do to, to build our budgets. Um, we do, um, our, our primary funder is the provincial government, Ministry of Transportation, as well as the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Um, but also the RDOS provides us funding both for treatment and for um, education. And then I typically hire summer students and get grants um, through the Federal Canada's and Jobs Program. So that just gives you a bit of flavor. That's a fair chunk of our, of our invasive terrestrial plant program right there. Um, there um, are some opportunities, I think, where um, OASIS could assist the district through um, training opportunities um, with staff, which actually I, we do on a regular basis, and we were scheduled to do one um, this year before COVID hit. Um, uh, resource materials, um, articles and newsletters in the newspaper, and so on. But I think what we need to look at um, is, is the on the ground. Um, I mentioned best management practices. Um, I've seen time and time again roadside practices in different municipalities water tweeting projects and they're huge, huge costs. And I look afterwards to see what the 
remediation and revegetation was, and, I go, and sometimes there's very little seed put on the ground. Um, yes, um, both myself and, and Councilor Van Alphen mentioned the gravel, but when you disturb it, they will come. Um, and when we're doing, you know, um, corridors of disturbance and not following up with effective revegetation, first and foremost, is going to come in those most opportunistic plants, and those are the invasive ones. So some real um, basic management changes and policies to be established within the district would be helpful. And those don't have to be high cost items. I mean, putting some an agronomic grass seed mix, it's inexpensive, very inexpensive, much more costly to go in after and spray or mow repeatedly for multiple years. Um, I, is this an opportunity for you to come up? And I don't, like, I think there's also an opportunity to look at um, timing of mowing and um, opportunity for perhaps enhancing the herbicide roadside program in the District of Summerland. As I understand right now, there's one person is trained to do herbicide pesticide application. Um, yeah, we have that problem as well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, I think this, this maybe is bringing to light an opportunity for the district to um, look at areas where a, um, an invasive plant management program could happen for roadsides and trails within, within your own boundaries that goes beyond what we are responsible for. Oasis is really doing work on, on the public and the crown. Councilor Barfoot? Yeah, um, you, you mentioned one thing I was going to ask you about, and that's the timing of our weed control. Um, are we getting there before they you know, go to seed, is that a thing? Um, for our roadside mowing, uh, is that an area that we should maybe invest some more? I mean, you can't do the whole town at once, that's the problem. Yeah. There, there's yeah. always room for improvement. I, I was actually really, I was just, I had actually drafted an email to send to public works to say how impressed I was this year when my phone started ringing about the issues of Toria Listen and, I, and complaints from some residents. And I, to be honest, I thought differently. And I, I relayed that um, to Mr. Stams. I, I thought today was excellent. Um, and or this year, sorry, this year was an excellent job of, of mowing. Um, but there's always room for improvement, um, and it's a balancing act. I don't know about capacity, and, you know, we go from um, street sweeping, and that needs to get done before we can shift gears, and do we have adequate, uh, you know, equipment for the mowing, and then um, do we need to prioritize our roads, you know, and then mowing, Roads is done for different reasons, you know, there's fire, so there's linking with the fire department and when they say you can and can't. So I think we all have to recognize the balancing act, but yeah, room, room for improvement, but I think looking maybe a little bit more to where possible doing some herbicide application would be, uh, would be really valuable. I have a few questions, Lisa. Yeah. Um, uh, Councillor Van Alphen got very close to the question I wanted to ask when he was mentioning the boulevard across from Giant's Head entrance, uh, entrance to Giant's Head Park. Do you know if your summer students have been out to check the trails on Giant's Head because there's been obviously a redevelopment project on your way up there? Um, I had not sent them to that area at this time, no. Okay, that answers one question and two others. Uh, you mentioned that Tori Lissom does really well in disturbed areas, but also, you know, equally well in dry and, and with a bit of moisture. Um, with the pastures and hay fields, where there can be like a huge contamination, if there is, um, does the effect, I guess, of extra moisture through irrigation, does that, would that negatively impact the horealism from gaining traction because uh, there might be, um, you know, more water for the, the pasture or the forage crop that's being grown? Not necessarily. Yeah, I'd have to look at, I think it really, you're, 
you'd have to be looking at different things like how uh, how healthy and dense the um, pasture forages were, um, what soils. the soils are like, yeah. and everything. It's yeah, typically very it's very site specific, and then it depends on the you know again the climatic conditions that year. I mean, I, this was an incredible. Um, year for the growth of Borealism. I've never seen such large plants. I've never seen it growing so early in the season, but it wasn't the only invasive plant that did it incredibly well with our wet spring. Great. Thank you. And then one uh, one final question. Uh, you were talking a little bit, uh, answering question, a question of Councillor Barco about where your funding comes from. Um, not sure if I should bring this up, but I'm going to. Uh, would it be uh, would you recommend that as part of our project estimates, whether we're um, applying for grants applications or or whatever, putting in a grant application or funding, getting funding other otherwise, um, would it be advisable in your opinion? to include a certain amount in that application or in the estimate uh, to cover post-project rehabilitation. Um, so if, let's say if we use the example of the Garnet Valley Water Twin, we heard from Councillor Van Elfen that there has been an increase in Horealism and also now. Um, perhaps from the movement of gravel, maybe from the disturbance, whatever it, it is. I'm wondering if there were, uh, I think the, the project cost was $6 million roughly. If there was a percentage that was part of that, say $6 million, or a percentage that was added on to the $6 million when we're doing the application to cover this rehabilitation, would you think that, um, what, would, what would your thoughts be on that? Yeah, no, really good question. Um, I would highly recommend with, with any project, um, I mean, I even encourage this with private landowners, whether it's small or large scale, but particularly when you're talking something like the Twain project, um, all the disturbance up on Giant's Head with the new trails, I, I had said right at the get-go, there needs to be a budget that goes at least, typically we recommend three to five years post-disturbance, a budget set aside for um, reseeding or replanting, and then monitoring to ensure successful germination and revegetation. And then knowing that some invasive plants will show up, and in that three to five years, taking actions, whether it's you know, manual or mechanical removal or spot spray, um, to remove or reduce the invasive plants, and then it, it, again, encourage the growth of whatever you've seeded or planted to the site. I, I think that's a critical component of, of any project, large or small, where there's going to be a soil disturbance, yes. And it's way more cost-effective to budget for that right at the get-go than come in after the fact and try and do the, the repair work. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Councillor Van Elfen. Just, if I may, is there a possibility that we could steal your plant, maybe we could take a picture of that plant and put it in our newsletter. And I know it's only one invasive species, but it's a start. The public, a lot of the public people, you know, public out there are phoning me, what's it look like? Your phone rang off the hook? Well, I, 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 my phone <laughs> rang off the hook. I apologize. Casting it, casting it, radio. I got calls from up in Nail, Nevada, but that's okay, again, I, it's not a bad thing. No. Um, it, it, it's getting the word out there and it's getting people talking about invasive plants in general. Yeah, but it's not, just a matter, you know, people don't know what it looks like. Yeah, I brought these plants so that they would stay here. So I just, I knew we could have probably passed them around. So I've got a bag here that they can go in. Um, so most most definitely I've got photographs that can go in the newsletter. Um, we can put something in the local newspaper. I Again, I think a multi-pronged approach is needed. Um, we are a little bit, we're at the tail end of it this year, but it doesn't hurt to start now. But we need to start now planning for how we're going to pro approach invasive plant management in general within the district for the coming years. 
Sorry about the phone call. Okay. Okay, any other questions? All right. Uh, again, we'd like to read a resolution forward. Receive this information and or Councillor Van Alphen. Receive the information, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Secretary, Councillor Patton, any further discussion? Councillor Holmes, I know you missed much of the presentation. Do you have any other questions to ask? Okay. <laughs> All right. If there's no further discussion, I'll call the question all in favor. None opposed. Thank you. Thanks for your time today, Lisa. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And Martin? Okay, uh, now we're on to item six, which is the first of two public comment opportunities. Uh, we have 15 minutes maximum, two minutes per speaker. And I see that uh, is Mr. Dyson on the phone to speak to this? Okay. Um, so, uh, Mr. Dyson, uh, go ahead when you're ready, please. Oh, and please also state your your name and your um, address, please. Okay, uh, my name is Michael Dyson. I'm an associate broker with Rose Page, and I'm the uh, authorized agent for uh, the Vista Country Estate. I'm also sitting here with uh, uh, Melanie, who is the current Stratus president. Uh, did you want the address of the specific property or my office address? Uh, the, uh, what do we want? Uh, the Strata is fine, right there. The Strata, please. Okay, uh, 9800 Turner Street. Thank you. Uh, so apologies, it's, uh, being on the phone call, it's, uh, it's a little sketchy uh, on our end. Um, but uh, I'm sure all council members have been given the package that's online uh, that has been um, put towards the municipal hall and the request for these trees. Uh, did you want me to read the cover letter or um, does any, has everybody read the uh, proposal? Is that the letter dated August the 17th? That's, yes. Is that the, yes, we, we have it in our agenda packages. Okay, great. Uh, so, in a nutshell, these, um, these large trees have been a, uh, an ongoing maintenance item for the strata, which obviously the strata does cover within their strata feed. Um, but uh, due to the size of these trees and the location of where they are in the boulevard, um, they are beginning to cause, um, right now, not huge costs, but they will become huge costs down the road. Uh, the trees are upheaving the uh, fence line uh, as well as the root system is lifting the city sidewalk. Uh, the root system is encroaching into the neighboring houses that are on the other side of that fence line. Uh, I believe there are uh, eight uh, residences there. Um, those roofs are causing a lot of damage to the, um, to the backyard of these areas to the, to the extent that it is very difficult to even mow the grass back there. Um, so we, uh, we first had an AGM uh, on February 23rd of 2020, where the ownership needed to um, obtain a three-quarter majority vote of those present to first alter the common property and have the owners agree that these trees were an issue and that they, uh, they would like to remove them and replace them with a suitable tree um, that we would be working with in the municipality um, to you know beautify the boulevards. Um, the ownership did obtain that vote and it is included in the package with you showing that the ownership would like to see them replaced. Um, now between February of 2020 and up to about June um, with correspondence between some council members, Melanie and uh, another council member, Linda, with Martin Sam, um, there was no indication that there would be any resistance to the trees being removed. Uh, Martin indicated that we needed to get a third party arborist um, to do up an assessment report, which the Stratus then did and incurred a cost to do so. That report was turned in and from about that point on, we started getting the resistance from the municipality. 
um, they did not basically accept the assessment report as a bulk assessment of the trees. They then want an independent uh, assessment on each tree, uh, which uh, you know we think is quite unreasonable given the situation. Um, I think at this point, the, the strata is hopefully uh, trying to work with you, the council, to see the current issue with these trees, the cost, uh, and the potential uh, extra cost down the road that we need to cover as a strata in order to deal with, with the uh, continued growth of these trees and continued maintenance of these trees. Um, we would like to see them removed. And we did work with the city's uh, horticulturalist to come up with three options that are much more suitable to that space. Uh, the strategy is not asking for any contribution from the city to cover these costs. The owners are prepared to do that, which they've already approved. And uh, hopefully today you guys can uh, discuss and, uh, and work with us in order to uh, prevent uh, future costs. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dyson. Just, just so you're aware, um, the first of our business items, which follows this uh, comment opportunity, is the discussion of your um, of the trees at uh, on Turner Street. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for your um, for your input, uh, Karen. Do we have anyone else on the line? I believe we do, Madam Mayor. Okay, uh, Mr. Campbell. Okay. Mr. Campbell, are you on the line currently? Is this Bob Campbell? Are you there, Mr. Campbell? I'll ask a third time. Um, Bob Campbell, are you on the line? Okay, well, perhaps Mr. Campbell will be available for a second opportunity. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. Now, yeah, well, so on to business item 7.1, 9800 Turner Street trees. And this is a report from um, our Director of Works and Infrastructure, Chris Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so as, as you heard on the call, uh, there was a, a request brought forward from La Vista Country Estates, the State Strata Council to look at the removal and replacement of, of the 12 London plane trees along their frontage on Turner Street. Uh, a bit of history, the trees were planted um, when the strata was initially developed by the strata developer. Um, the strata has advised in the past that was advised in the past that these trees could only be removed with the district's permission. Um, and that if the trees were assessed in the past and determined to be healthy and, and not to pose a risk to public safety or to district infrastructure at that time. Um, the district's practice in these situations in the past has been only to remove either unhealthy trees or trees that pose a risk to the public safety or to district, district infrastructure. Um, so with that, the strata as was noted by Mr. Dyson, was uh, had retained a qualified professional to assess the trees. Um, in June, the strata submitted the assessment and met with the district to discuss a replanting design. <clears throat> so this was under the assumption that the trees were unhealthy and that they were posing a risk. Um, so the district reviewed the assessment and informed the strata that the findings in the report didn't warrant the removal of the trees, that all of the trees <clears throat> were not showing signs of distress or unhealth and that currently in their current state we're not posing a risk. Um, so with that the district advised that it doesn't support the removal of, of nuisance trees um, and in most situations where tree assessments identify risks uh, alternative options to mitigate the risks such as modifications to the tree were, would be recommended before removal is considered. Um, so with that the, the district stance um, <clears throat> based on our previous uh, previous decisions from previous councils would be not to support the removal and replacement, uh, but to look at how these risks and issues can be mitigated in the meantime. 
that being said, um, the trees will continue to grow, and at some point in the future, they may pose a risk to our infrastructure, and they may become unhealthy or pose a risk to the public safety in the future. Um, so, with the proposal on the table that the strata is looking at to fully fund the removal and replacement is something that council should consider, um, but based on past practice, staff do not support this. Any questions from the council? I'll be happy to answer. Councillor Holmes and then Councillor Train. Yeah, thank you. So, the, um, the Arborist report is the one um, from June 16th, the trees report. Correct. Right. So, this report doesn't really say anything about the trees one way or another. It's, it's uh, if, if I was the strata council, I'd go back to them and say, okay, this is all great, except they don't even talk about the treats in question. So how are we, how is any kind of decision made on this? I don't know. I, I think we, they have to go back and, 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 uh, and ask, ask them to do the report again and, and actually talk about the trees in question. True. That's true, and that's some of the that's what the issues that we have raised with them as well. Councilor Trainer, can you just be able to clarify for me um, who owns the sidewalk? Is that district infrastructure? Yeah. So the sidewalk and the boulevard where the trees are planted are within the road right away. It is okay. Um, so if the trees were to be removed, um, would would the strata have to pay to get that sidewalk redone, or would the sidewalk even need to be redone if they were pulled up? If the sidewalk was jacked damaged during the removal and replacement, then mm -hmm. yes, we would. Our understanding would be that that would be covered in the removal and replacement. I, I, my understanding is though that they would be looking at a process to do that without touching or damaging that sidewalk. And, and I guess these were put in a long time ago, and there appears to be some protection along that edge. There must be some level of root barrier that was installed because due to the size and proximity of these trees to the sidewalk and the elevation difference between them, you would expect to see some damage. And there was only minor heaving on one panel um, on this whole entire section of sidewalk in front of one of the trees. So there appears to be some level of protection, but um, yeah. As the developer of the net, he probably would have thought about that. Um, um, do you think you said that the trees will likely get bigger? So, is it likely in the future then that sidewalk um, may continue to deteriorate or move as a result of the roots? We would, we would expect that, yeah, the, the, the chance and probability of damage to the sidewalk and to the roadway would increase over time as those continue to grow. Okay, thank you. Councilor Marco? Oh, in the Somewhere down the road, <clears throat> 25 years goes pretty fast. Um, if the trees grew to a size where they're damaging the sidewalk, who would be responsible for removing and replacing the sidewalk? Um, in that situation, that's where I believe the district would. We would take the initiative to look at mitigating the damage being caused by these trees. So I see this as an opportunity we can have to turn down. Um, Maybe the current situation is not that bad. I go down there and have a look, and you know they're providing nice shade and everything. And, but if uh, they're willing to pay that much money to have them removed and replaced with something uh, more appropriate, and they're the ones that are most affected by it, um, and I I don't see why we would not go along with it. I understand completely the district's policy and they have to apply the policy so it's quite right that it came to council. <laughs> and, and But it's one of those situations where um, policy doesn't quite fit and we should take advantage of this um, opportunity to, to have somebody else pay the bill for what might be a problem for us down the road. Thank you. Councillor um, I'm just wondering if you know how many, um, how many of the seven 
properties actually have roots that have come through? Is it just one property that has roots in the backyard? That's right. I don't know that answer. Um, and my other question is, there's some discussion about having a plan for replanting, but I don't see that. Um, so I can I assume that staff have looked at what the plan is and that the trees that perhaps are chosen for that wouldn't cause the same problem in 25 or 50 years? Because all trees have roots. Yeah, so there was a draft plan that was, uh, that was submitted and discussed with staff. Um, and we mainly looked at the species and the type of plants that they were looking to uh, propose for the replanting and have gotten comments um, from our horticulturalists to ensure that they were appropriate for that location. Uh, then as far as the details, the number and, and that, um, I don't think that's been confirmed, but th it, there has been an initial draft plan that has been reduced to ensure. Um, I believe though they're only looking at three larger trees to be um, replaced on a session with a, lot small, a number of smaller planting in between. So we would have to work with them to, to or, or if the council has any, any thoughts on approving the removal and replacement, then um, the number of larger trees for a similar type of canopy, uh, the direction on that council may wish to Councillor Holmes? Final that are appropriate for the location, but we don't know yet whether the plant, the, the trees that are there are inappropriate for the location uh, because the, the, the report doesn't tell us anything. So, so we have no idea. London plain trees are planted in, in urban centers all around the world. They're, you know, they're, they're all along the Champs Elysees in Paris. I don't see the Champs Elysees being ripped out. They're all around Madison Square in New York. I don't see Madison Square being ripped out. You know, so I, I, I just don't. Uh, it, unless there's a report that, that that actually says there's a problem, you know, what are we trying to fix? Councillor Van Alphen? Thank you, Madam Mayor. If the strata then became financially responsible to remove these trees, the new trees planted, would there have to be root barriers put in against the sidewalk and uh, at their cost and all that? There is a root barrier there as currently, and it could be salvaged. So that would, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Patton first, and then back to you, Councillor Marple. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. A um, few questions. Have we um, changed out any of the sidewalk panels um, on the, along that stretch? From what I recall from uh, my investigation on the 4th of September, I don't recall there being any new panels. Um, all, all of the pictures have been included in the report, so I can verify, but I don't believe there have been any. And have we done, or has the district uh, completed any uh, sidewalk grinding in regards to the difference in elevations where the sidewalk has moved? No, it was only noted in one location, and it was near the boulevard side of the sidewalk on one corner. It was approximately a centimeter of, of elevation difference, so nothing has been done at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marco? Yeah. In response to Councillor Holmes' comments, and I agree that from our point of view in the district, we, we don't have a problem, at least not yet. But obviously the residents there who are willing to fund this whole thing out of their own pocket do have a problem. And why shouldn't we respect that they're willing to spend their money to deal with this problem? And uh, why should we be uh, a barrier to that, to the fix, to their issue? Um, just, yeah. I think Councillor Holmes would like to respond to that, and then we'll get to Councillor Van Elton. I guess if we had a better idea of what the response was, you could be creating one problem, uh, you know, fixing one problem, creating uh, another. Uh, I, I don't really see replacing seven trees. Well, place seven or twelve. Twelve, 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 three. All right. Councillor Van Alphen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It is, it's, you know, I mean, it's all fine and dandy when the subdivision was created that the person building the subdivision was required to plant these trees. And it's not just for the subdivision. 
neighbors. There's people across the road that enjoy these trees too. They enjoy the wind break, the, the shade, the wildlife, and all that stuff that's, that's part of this hedge of trees. Um, yeah, we could, you know, I mean, it's fine and dandy, they're willing to pay for it all, but again, we can, somebody else could have this conversation 20, 25 years from now again. You know, I mean, if there's a panel on a sidewalk that needs someone, it can be addressed. You know, those things can be addressed. I'm looking at a photo here of a wall that shows a crack. Is that a concrete block wall? No, I, I believe it's a, it's a timber wall with plywood that that's, has a stucco finish. So it, it appears to be, from the, from the, the appearance appears to be some sort of a concrete wall, but I believe it's just a timber wall with a stucco finish. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Councilor Barcourt. Um, in respect to the uh, Councillor Holmes' comments on what these will be replaced with, my understanding from the staff was that there is a plan: um, three large trees and maybe smaller trees that you know um, don't have quite the same canopy uh, in, in dispersed. Uh, I think that we can leave it that, uh, with staff that they provide uh, that there's a, a suitable plan for the replacement and it's um, a, you know equal uh, quality you might say I mean I have to agree that the, the aesthetics of the trees that are there now are nice but if it's causing a problem and, and people are willing to pay to replace that with something that will be equally as good and it saves us money down the road when it becomes our problem I, I think it's an opportunity we ought to take um, do you have another question for staff before you have the floor? Well, I guess uh, um, that is the, uh, the understanding, correct? That you would work with the uh, strata to to uh, approve a appropriate replacement canopy, correct? Thank you, Councillor Trainer. Yes, I think there's a question. Um, the question. It would be nice to uh, see a plan. Um, for the replacement um, before we approve of the 12 trees because I think as Councillor Van Alton said like they're pretty abundant of everybody mm -hmm. and those trees contribute to our community in many different ways and I understand where the residents are coming from but um, we have to see the bigger picture too and so I think for me I would like to see what, what's going to go in there and, and how that will affect the surrounding community before I really feel comfortable um, <clears throat> allowing the removal of 12 trees. And is that something that would come back to council or, or would that be a staff um, issue, seeing the final plan? If the council requested it come back, it could definitely come back. Okay. So we could defer this decision and request a, a further information from staff? Yeah, I would just like a little bit more information on what this would look like. Because again, it's not like it's one or two trees, it's 12, and that's quite significant on a street. And especially because they're all on district property, I just feel like we need a bit more information before we make a decision. Would you like to make that resolution then? That motion? Sure. Is, is that a reasonable motion? Do what the class or the Oh, sorry? Can we comment to that? Um, before you go that far? <laughs> um, well, this is the opportunity to ask questions of staff. Um, if, but you can certainly comment once it's seconded, because it's on the floor, but it's not it hasn't been seconded yet. And then I'll go to you, Councillor Barkley. Is there a seconder? Um, Councillor Carlson, thank you. Go ahead. Um, I would argue against this motion because uh, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of urban tree planting for this location or other locations throughout the municipality. We have uh, things like uh, has to come to council for any landscape development in the Bentley Road area that costs fifty thousand dollars or more, and we get the, these things and we look at it and say, well, why is this at the council table? Um, there's landscaping for all of the Hunters Hill. You know, it's not at the council table, but that's a hugely significant landscaping thing, and this is just one more landscaping issue that I think we should be able to trust staff to uh, make a decision. They're, they've got a professional horticulturist as to what is a reasonable um, alternative to the present canopy. So. Councillor Barcourt? Yeah, I, I 
outcomes for your homes? Um, yeah, I would say the difference is it's because we're talking about replacing something that's perfectly okay the way it is, and, 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 and so if you're, you're going to make that decision. You know, I, I would, you know, I don't see the full details of, of the plan, but we like to have you know, a general idea of what they're intending to do. It would be nice, and, and I would, you know, personally, you know, I, I always I would support I'll support this motion, but personally, I'd also like to, to see a proper arborist report that actually addresses the issue. That's not necessary. Plus, I was distracted. That's what I would certainly Councilor Trainer. I guess the reason I would like to see a plan too is just so that um, we know that you know, this doesn't happen again in 25 years. Like, um, we, you know, like I said, it's 12 trees. That's quite significant. It's not like it's one or two when they're mature trees, and, and like Council Holmes said, as far as we know, there's nothing wrong with them. So um, I would just, I miss, I'd like to see what, what their plans are in a little bit more detail um, and make sure that we're, everybody's happy with that before. Okay, I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, I, I agree with what Council Trainer is saying. But I think I'll be voting against this motion only because um, we, as Councilor Barkle just said, we have um, a horticulturist on staff. And uh, whether or not the horticulturalist agrees with the plan, um, the fact is the horticulturalist, or at least the report that's come forward and our own horticulturist has said, at least this is what I understand from staff, that they're the trees are not unhealthy, they're not diseased, they're not posing a risk to safety or a risk to um, district infrastructure. So I'm not sure why uh, we would proceed with um, e even the, the interim step of looking at a plan when, it, in my opinion, I don't want to see the removal of 12 healthy trees. Um, they, they grow in there for 25 years, they're substantial, and you can't replace a 25-year-old tree with another 25-year-old tree, it just can't be done. So that's why I will be voting against the motion. Thanks. Okay, so any other comments before we vote on this? Okay, all in favor? So that motion is defeated. Councillor Carlson. Would you like to bring forward a motion? I will bring forward a motion. Thank you. I will move that I request from La Vista Country State Strata Council to remove and replace the existing boulevard trees in front of 9800 Turner Street be denied. Seconder. Councillor Van Alphen. Okay, now the opportunity to discuss this this new motion that's on the floor. Any further comments? Councillor Cross. I'll just, just state that I agree with what the mayor just said prior to the previous vote. Okay, Councillor Van Alphen. Or sorry, okay, Councillor Patton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm, I, I'm afraid I'm going to go with my colleague, uh, Councillor Barclow, on this. I think it was any of our properties that were being, um, where we were seeing some damage caused by the uh, a tree in a public boulevard that we also would want to see what could be done to alleviate the damage that's being, that's being done. The report does say that the trees um, do have um, uh, some disease, a fungal disease, and tree something, has become established within all 12 trees. The spores cause dark uh, uh, lesions on leaves in the case of this species. Uh, affected the twigs and branches. So there is some issues already regarding the tree, um, all 12, and, and it's based in the report how how in depth they go is probably they could have done a better job when in depth. But um, I feel that if the strata is willing to go to the expense and to alleviate the damages that are going to happen to, 
further on the strategy, and I'm in full support of them um, moving forward with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Barbo. Yeah, um, Councillor Patton brings forward a, a thought that I guess was there all the time, but really needs to be stated. And that, well, and the two things is that um, even if you uh, accept the proposition that um, trees don't need to be removed, there's no compelling need in the reports to remove the trees. And uh, I can go along with that, but the report doesn't suggest that they should be removed. It's clear that there are a nuisance tree to the property owners. There must be uh, a, a very bad nuisance to them with, I don't know, the, the seed things that fall off and make a mess or whatever, the uh, unsightliness on certain times when the fungus is there. But whatever the case is, it must be pretty bad because they're pretty motivated by a large uh, group of property owners there, not just people, you know, the seven people along the road, but the you know, it takes the majority of the stratum on this. And if it was on your property and you're bordering your yard and it was such a nuisance that you'd be willing to take the tree out and replace it and pay for horticulturalists and professionals to do all that work, you got to know that it must be pretty annoying to them and that, uh, it, uh, you know, it, 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 you have to consider, like, well, if it was your yard, you know, wouldn't it be reasonable to think just because it's a few inches across the property line that um, this can't be done to what they feel is an improvement, an improvement they're going to spend a lot of money for, not as more than I think I would. I, I just might want to respond to that, Councillor Berkel. Um, I think that there is, uh, there are mitigation steps that are possible um, between leaving the tree there and removing the tree. I think that there are ways of mitigating the impact of the trees in between those two steps. I don't think it's, you know, either you stay or you're removed. I think there's something in between. So that's that's why I am um, voting in denial of this. Councillor Holmes. Yes, thank you. Certainly my... Uh my inclination is to support the motion and vote in denial. Um, I would have wished the, the previous motion had passed though because I would have liked to have to, to have given them an opportunity to change my mind because I don't feel I have more information. Um, but um, that being as may, I'll, I'll support the motion. Any further discussion? Councillor Trainer. I'll, I'll support the motion as well, but um, I would have liked to have had a bit more information um, to see if there is any other possibility that could help them out, whether some of the trees are removed or replaced with, uh, maybe we could have some of them. Um, but yeah, I would have liked to have a bit more information. So maybe in the future we can look at this again sometime, but for now I'll be supporting. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Chris, and maybe Martin. Um, as time goes on, if if this um, denial is approved, um, how often do you monitor? How, how often would you monitor these trees in terms of seeing if there is increased uh, risk to safety or other damage? We uh, generally. Uh, monitor them based on complaints um, for do a full assessment, um, but in this case uh, we do drive-bys. Um, we do the same uh, with the electrical utility as well. Uh, when we uh, we get lists, but we drive the roads, and if there's any reason to suspect the trees, then that would trigger a further assessment. But um, initially, all they look for is healthy canopy and based on that and some other points, they decide whether further assessment is required or if the public complains. Okay, and then maintenance of the trees, is that an annual thing? Like um, pruning, for example? We do not prune these trees. We yes. sweep the, the leaves off the road in the, in the fall. That's about it. Okay, and they're pruned up high enough that there's no- Correct. Over the, okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Barco. Um, when you buy a replacement tree, you can get a little stick that will take years to get big, or you can buy a larger, more mature tree, it costs considerably more. Horticulturists always say all you're doing is buying time. So to some of my other counselors, um, if they came back with a little bit more information as to why these trees are such a problem to them and um, diagrams and such a, a more specifics of what the replacement trees might look like, how big they would be, you know, the assurance that they're not going to be something that'll look great in another 25 years, but in between it's going to be pretty poor, uh, would it cost for, be cost for some reconsideration? Perhaps, Mike. <laughs> okay. Thank you for bringing that up, Councilor Bronco. Um, I uh, we have a we have a motion on the floor that's been seconded, so we have to vote on this. Um, we could have another motion brought forward if this is defeated. So uh, right now, the request is, uh, the motion's on the floor is that the request be denied. If there is no further discussion, I will call the question. All in favor? Opposed? So that is carried. Okay, thank you for that. On to 7.2. Jury Laundry Electrical Service Upgrade Financing, and this is a report from the General Manager of our Electrical Utility, Jeremy Storvold. Madam Mayor? Oh, pardon me. If I may, we did yes. actually get um, Mr. Campbell on oh. the line. If it's, yes, if it's Council's wish, we can have him speak now. Council? Mr. Barkwell, you're, or Councilor Barkwell, you're okay with him speaking now as well? Be council, yes, it does. Okay, we've all got, we've all nodded. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Campbell, please go ahead. station in the background that could be turned down. Did you hear that, Mr. Campbell? I didn't know. Um, uh, our corporate officer is wondering if maybe there's a radio or the YouTube channel is open in the background that could just be turned down. Is that... Okay, so I don't have, I don't have any... I actually have your video on, but I don't have any audio on, so I just... Turn off your channel completely. Will that will that help you think? That should be okay, Mr. Campbell. I'm wondering if there's someone else on the line, if they could mute their phone. Uh, I don't think so. There's only three of us in the office right now, and I don't believe anybody else is on the line. Okay. I think we can proceed and see how it goes from now. Okay. So uh, we're requesting some consideration from council to uh, uh, alleviate to some degree the pain of the expense that we're going to incur to put this three phase in by uh, allowing us to pay over time. And I'm told by the administration that they don't have the authority to do that without council support. So uh, what, what, is, what has happened is we've had uh, quite a bit of experience of expansion 
and over the last 14 years, we've, we've, uh, we uh, uh, acquired the property in 2006, and it was quite a small winery at the time, uh, producing about 1,800 cases a year. Through that 14-year period, of, uh, we've increased production to about 40,000 cases. Uh, we've increased our farming from about five acres to over 100 acres. And we've increased our cellar space from about 600 square feet to about 10,000 square feet. Um, going forward, we have a plan to increase our warehousing by another 10,000 square feet in two different phases. And that will allow us to acquire our own watering line for starters in the first phase. So we have a considerable uh, amount of expense ahead of us. Uh, but right now, this, this time of year, uh, we have a cash flow uh, issue because we have to set aside about a billion and a half to buy breaks. So we would like to start preparing for this expansion and getting the three-phase power installed. Uh, but it comes at a time where uh, funds that we have is going to be allocated to buying breaks for the uh, upcoming season uh, fermentation. So what we've asked council to look at, or asked the administration to look at, would be to spread the burden of this expense uh, over a period of a couple of years, and uh, and or to help us out by waiving the administration fee which charge. Um, so uh, we're able to able and quite prepared to pay about one third of the cost. The cost is going to, as I understand it. Somewhere in the vicinity of 130 to 140 thousand dollars, we want to expand about 50 thousand dollars on site to prepare for the tree phase. So um, we, our proposal is to pay a third now to ask you to spread the balance over a couple of years by monthly installment. Uh, we are hoping that uh, that will take place without interest, but um, we're at your mercy, obviously, in, in that regard. Um, and so that's it. So we're just asking you to have some consideration for the, the cash flow of the local business. Uh, we think we're a very important business to the community. At our peak, we employ about 55 people during uh, the peak four months of the year. Uh, we have uh, over a 12 month period to employ. We have 17 full time positions. It increased to about 35 for about eight months, and then for about four months, we have 55 employees and workforce. So uh, we're, we're not, uh, uh, we, we have a considerable impact in terms of the economy of the uh, District of Summerland. We're hoping that you can help out with something. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Jeremy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So as you heard from uh, Mr. Campbell, who gave a pretty good summary there, uh, this request for decision is in regards to a Dirty Laundry Vineyard's request for a payment plan for their electrical service. The electrical service is estimated at 140999 24 so about 141000 uh, Dirty Laundry Vineyard further requests that the administrative charge of 8785 also be waived. And those are estimated values. Um, and as you know, uh, at the electric utility, we charge actuals at the end of the job. As part of the council report, we've attached the electrical service estimate and design, along with Dirty Laundry's written request, and an excerpt from Penticton's bylaw showing how they do payment plans. Uh, Penticton is the only BC MAU that does provide that often. Please note that the existing Summerland bylaws do not have provisions for the payment plan, but the upcoming electric utility bylaw rewrite, rewrite will provide opportunity for council to review some options there, and we can discuss that at that time. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And if you have any questions, we'll do our best to answer. Thank you. Council? Questions for Jeremy? Councillor Holmes and then Councillor Carlson. Thank you. So we're not allowed to do uh, installment plans because our bylaw doesn't allow it or because our, our system, like, we don't have the uh, capability to do it in our payment system. 
the Madam Mayor, the uh, electric utility bylaw 2255 states that all the electrical services must be paid up front. Current bylaw states that. So we have no technical no problem with our finances. Council yeah. Barco? Yeah. Um, there is, and I, I forgot to look this up, but there is a um, uh, something in the community charter about not being able to provide any advantage to any individual business. Uh, how would that fit in with that aspect of the community charter? Maybe it's a question for a corporate officer. Mm -hmm. Dave, let's speak. Sorry, our director of finance is willing to speak to that. Okay, thank you. I'll try to speak to it. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, in, re in regards to the assistance of business, uh, the allowing allowing somebody to pay uh, their rate over one or, or three years is, is not really considered assistance. Uh, when you look at our DCC bylaw, our DCC bylaw actually does allow uh, people to pay their DCCs over, uh, I think it's a three year period. So from that perspective, it's, it's not really assistance. Uh, it's just the way our, our current bylaw is written where everyone has to pay up front. The, the part that could be looked at as aiding a business would be the, the interest component. Um, if the district was, was not to charge interest, uh, one could look at that and, and say that, well, you are now aiding this business because business C uh, may not have the same opportunity to come to the district and have their interest waived. They could go to a bank and potentially have to borrow the funds to pay something and they would have to pay interest. So uh, that interest component is, is definitely one that could be viewed as uh, assisting a business, but not the actual uh, delaying payment over a three year period. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barco? Well, I could understand that um, delay of payment, um, if it's in a bylaw and available for everybody as far as development cost charges are concerned, or as in the case of Penticton, any application up to I know uh, fifty thousand dollars only um, would not be assisting a particular business. But if it's something that isn't available to everybody through bylaw, uh, it kind of looks to me like we're giving a uh, assistance to a business that is not available to others. That's a, you know, I think it's a, a real distinction there. Thanks for um, just to, to follow up on that, and I and just for clarification, so there's three three alternatives here, and the one that's being suggested for approval is a payment over 24 months with no interest. Um, but then the taxpayers in Summerland are all are then paying for that. Um, so I'm just wondering. Are there any situations where Summerland acts as a bank? I mean, if that would be what this is, I and mean, the Bank of Summerland doesn't exist. But. So I'm just wondering why it would be the one suggested for approval and not the one with interest. I think they're asking us to choose from these alternatives. And I deny approve, though. I'm just wondering. Oh, I see what you mean. So I'm just wondering in the recommendations that have been made, why the one that has no interest would be the one requested for approval, if that's legal. Uh, to clarify, Madam Mayor, uh, in, in reading the three resolutions, the, the denied, denied, and the approved are specific to just the administration chart. Oh, okay. Um, it's, yeah, it's specific to that administration chart. Uh, in, in each of the individual uh, resolutions. The way Except for the first one. The first, first one re it includes the interest. Correct. The staff are seeking counsel uh, to, per to pick one of the three Councillor Holmes? So, my reading of all three of the options, and just part of just in respect to the administrative charges. So, there's not really 
are we looking for a motion at all or, or whatever the, uh, your other request? I think it all has to do with the, the financing. The first one includes interest, the other two don't. Councilor Trainer. Does anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, I will put them up. Do you have a question? Okay. Councilor Barkley. Well, further to the discussion that came up, I, I look at uh, suggestion number three, if that's what you want to call it, it says uh, that the request from the property owners was very long. They went through the service on the front, two and three, two thirds monthly over 24 months with no interest. Um, so that, that means that, and that was the one that's recommended, and that's a waiving of the interest. Sorry, Councilor Barco, I figured it out. It's just in formatting, because normally I think we would see, and further that would be its own thing, but I, I, it says approved, and then it says denied, so there's two, there's approval and a denial within one sentence. That's why I, so I just misread it, and so that's why I was a little bit confused. If you read, you just have to read it a little bit more carefully. Number three? All of them. It's a little <laughs> ambiguous. Oh, good. I'm. I'm yeah. <laughs> so somebody is being approved and one is inferred and then you deny within the same breath. Do you understand, Councilor Barclay? Choose from the following alternatives either one, two, or three? Yes. Um, the, the way it's written, though, is. Um, it just as Councillor Carlson was was uh, trying to explain, the first one has the interest rate being approved, but that the waiver be denied. And so then, that's an alternative. It says to choose from one of these following alternatives. Yeah, yes. But <laughs> uh, maybe somebody else can explain. Okay, okay, Anthony, please. Um, I can't get up on the screen, but um, if we're just reading through the alternatives, uh, we've obviously got a request in front of council. The request from the property owner is the uh, phasing in with no interest, sorry, the three-year three phasing with no interest, and the uh, waiver of the administration fee. So alternative three is exactly what the property owner has requested. The other alternatives in front of council uh, relate to number one, the first part of that, um, uh, uh, alternative, if council is to support that, would allow dirty laundry vineyards to pay one third of the costs up front with the remaining two thirds paid monthly over 24 months with interest calculated at prime interest rate plus 25%, and that the waiver of the administration charge be denied. So, in alternative number one, that would support the request for a phase in approach, however, not supportive of the administration charge. The uh, uh, second second um, uh, alternative is that the request from the property owner, uh, dirty laundry, to pay one third of the service costs up front with the remaining two thirds paid over 24 months with no interest and the waiver of the admin charge be denied. So that would deny both of the requests that have come forward. So the first one provides half, I guess, of uh, what is being requested. The second denies both and the third supports everything that the property owner has requested. And again, for the reasons we've outlined in the report, um, uh, staff uh, uh, would be concerned with obviously alternative number three, which is uh, why the alternative would be brought forward for council review. Just a sec, I just want to make sure that Council Barco is, is good now with that. Mm, not really. I'm right? the only one here that uh, reads this. Am I out of step with the whole because uh, the way it reads that the request, you have to take it literally, that the request from the property owners of Dirty Vineyard to pay one third of the service costs up front with the remaining two thirds paid monthly over 24 months with no interest and the waiver of the charge be approved. So you, if, you, if we approve the uh, alternative number three, they would not be charged any interest? Correct. Okay. And, and they would be charged the waiver. 
I mean, they wouldn't be charged the admin fee. And that's what um, the director of development, corporate uh, development, or, um, finance said we, we can't be waiving interest. Yes. Yeah. And that's the one that Mr. Campbell would like to see, number three. So you're good then? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Van Alphen and then Councillor Train. So this is Councillor Holmes. This is something that's not done on a daily basis in municipal government, I'm assuming. I guess Penticton does do it to an extent. Um, what's collateral? Do we put a lien on title? You know, I, I'm just I'm just asking the question because I could be a business owner in the future asking for the same thing because we've given it now and in, Prior to the two years, I go, I have financial difficulties and I lose my business, then who's on the hook? So do we, what are we asking for title? Like do, is there a lien put against title on that land titles and counties until the bill is paid? Mm -hmm. I'm just asking, throwing it out there. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the community charter, in the community charter, there's a section that uh, speaks to something like this when the municipality is allowed for certain works uh, if those works are not paid for to put the bill directly against uh, the individual's property taxes. So what would happen in this instance is if the district received one third and then for some reason uh, we did not receive the other two thirds uh, through legislation, we could put the remaining two thirds onto the property taxes um, and if there was such financial hardship uh, with either this or any other business, uh, after three years of delinquent taxes, uh, the district would then sell the property uh, at a tax sale and recoup our funds that way. So there would be uh, there would be no direct lien on the property per se, but uh, the district would have recourse to ensure that we collected what was owed to. Thank you. Councilor Trainer? Uh, Councilor Holmes. Councilor Holmes. Yes, thank you. So if, um, if if we change the electric bylaw at some point, then there's a different payment options become available to allow uh, installment payments. Could they be able to come back to us and, uh, and make provisions to, 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 to do that? Or, or, installments if we don't allow it right now and uh, and uh, what what sort of time frame are we looking at for, for these updates yeah madam mayor we're uh, looking to bring a uh, new bylaw for the council this year before the end of the year um, after legal review etc and some uh, community consultation um, <coughs> and once the new bylaws in place they would uh, potentially qualify for that depending on what council was to decide uh, would be the qualifications for that, that uh, payment program. So, uh, for example, Penticton has a $50,000 cap. Um, so we may um, move forward something like that or whichever way council decides at that time. Okay. Councilor Trainer, Councilor Holmes, Councilor they have a $50,000 cap, is that what you said? Penticton. Penticton. Yes, uh, City Penticton uh, does offer their electric utility service specifically offers a payment program. I believe it's over five years. It's attached to the report and it has a cap of $50,000. And there is an interest charge. Okay. Um, I, I just quickly figured out, so if they pay one third, they would still owe 93000 um, two questions, if I may. Uh, the, did the owner offer any um, reason why he should get this break over every other utility or electrical customer we have in Saran and the other 27 wineries and, and such? Um, other than the fact that he feels that uh, you know, he has cash problems that are maybe greater than other wineries. And secondly, when 
development cost charges are um, it, are uh, they're about to be paid over time. Is that more related to payment as lots uh, are sold uh, in the development, or how is that the deferral for development cost charges or, you know, sort of factored in or determined? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Two part question there. So, for the first question, um, with uh, Mr. Campbell, we didn't get into um, why his specific business should be eligible for something like this, although uh, they are um, one of the few wineries that needs the three phase and doesn't have, isn't available, and, and it's a high cost to, to get that um, because it's quite a ways away um, for, for three phase. So we do have about 10 structures to put into to bring that power to them. And um, as far as uh, the Penticton program or, or how we how we would um, help out a developer um, on a lot by lot basis, we currently don't do that today and the bylaw doesn't allow for that. No, the um, uh, finance director said that development cost charges are, are based in or done over time or something. What is the program there? Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, so in theory, uh, DCCs uh, are allowed to be collected over over a time period. And the premise behind it is that uh, with a lot of these developments, the DCC charges are can become quite uh, quite expensive, and a lot of them are due to phase in uh, lots and those types of things. So that's kind of the, the overall premise behind that uh, in allowing for the collection over uh, over two or three. So related to the sales, correct. Um, uh, I have a question about the numbers. Is the admin charge included in the roughly 141, or are they two two separate figures? Those are included. Okay, so the total is the 141 then. Thank you. Um, and your response to Council Barkle a minute ago made me write down another question. Is there any benefit? You mentioned that there's a number of um, structures that you have to install in order to get phase three power out there because it's you know kind of a ways away. Um, is there any benefit to anyone other than dirty laundry potentially with this extra infrastructure? Madam Mayor, it doesn't seem that way. There's very few customers along that road and very few customers that are commercial. So there are a couple of residential customers. Uh, I don't expect any other customer along there to require three phase anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Barco, I was just wondering, um, there is a letter from Dirty Laundry, attachment three, request from Dirty Laundry, and I think that that might answer um, a little bit of your question about why they were asking for this at this point. Um, it does refer to the existing business environment impacted by the pandemic. Um, it says all businesses must move to greater frugality in their operations until revenues are no longer impacted by government responses to the pandemic. Um, I would suggest that this government is in the same position in terms of having to uh, modify our budgets, we have to do budget amendments, and that there has been impacts to our revenues as well. And as Councillor Carlson mentioned, um, if we're a local government with our own budgets, we're not a lending authority or a lending institution, so we probably shouldn't be speaking that way quite yet because there's nothing on the floor, but anyways, so, no, uh, Councilor Barkley. Uh, um, maybe you answered this, but I wasn't 100% sure. I, I, I understood that from the comments that if one way or the other this work would be started very soon and completed very soon, what is this time kind of schedule? Madam Mayor, it is not scheduled because uh, currently we don't schedule any work until we have full payment up front. So, um, we're waiting for a decision here and, and once we see the decision here, we'll speak to the um, applicant and we'll schedule the work or not schedule the work. Well, what would be your capability to do the work if, um, if you know, there is a go 
decision by either council or himself to be moved tomorrow. If uh, all the requirements are met, say today, we, we could schedule it fairly quickly because this job is going to be done by a contractor. We don't have the full equipment complement to actually build this job ourselves. So we uh, we have a uh, fixed price with a contractor for this particular job. Yeah. So it, it would be a matter of what their schedule looks like. And I, I suspect it would be uh, pretty timely within a couple months. Councilor Patton? Thank you, um, First question to our director of finance. Um, at our last council meeting, um, we were talking about administration charge being 15%. And now with the electrical, they're talking administrative charge of 7%. Do we not have a standard administration charge or is it each department gets to offset their own administration charge as they move forward? I guess it should have been at the last council meeting. Um, we do have a standard administration charge of 15%. The electrical utility is a little bit different. Uh, again, because it is one of only five utilities in all of BC. Uh, and with electrical works, they can become quite expensive quite quickly. Uh, so at some point in time, historically, there was a, a decision that was made where up to a certain amount of billings, it was at 15%, and then anything over that was at 7%. I, I don't know when uh, that was instituted, but uh, that, uh, that's how the electrical utility works. The remainder of uh, all the other funds are at 15%. Thank you. Um, my second question. So how far uh, can, uh, let's say, um, the uh, Sandu farm uh, that is straight across the field from 31, if they wanted to go into three days that they don't have, um, are they too far away to have a, sorry, are they too far away to have the benefit of that three days power? Uh, Madam Mayor, I have to check electrical map, but I believe that particular farm has three phase rate as already at the roadway. Um, so this wouldn't benefit them in, in any way. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Van Alken. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burns, another question. Can you go cross country from San Jose? We would have to look at that. Just the thought for cost. Um, the other thing too is, yeah, because then you're looking at quite a shorter distance, I would think, I, I'm not sure. The other question I have is how long, like how long would it take to get a bylaw from a council? You know, to, to um, be able to address these types of situations. Because at this point in time, we make a decision today and it's 90 something thousand dollars and then it comes to a bylaw it does come to council and we adopt something similar to pet ticket at fifty thousand dollars you know i just want to make sure we're being fair to all the customers you know all potential customers out there i mean and then we have other major customers in town one on shell avenue that i think spent a significant amount of money on a transformer and another one on dale meadows you know, and that's not that long ago that weren't offered these opportunities either. So, like, I'm not denying or saying I don't want to look at getting into the time payment situation and interest, but I think we need to get a bylaw, like ASAP in front of council so we can make a decision on what ceiling do we want to put on this bylaw. Is it 50000 Is it 90000 Is it 100000 You know? Um, I want to be fair to all the customers in Summerland. And I mean, you know, there's industrial parks in Bentley Road that have built, you know, some pretty significant infrastructure and have spent some significant monies in the past that weren't offered these situations. You know, so, <laughs> you know, I just don't think we can do for one and not the others. Okay. Councillor, um, so your question then was how, how quickly we could get this in front of council? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I apologize. Yeah. No, that's okay. 
But we just didn't hear the, the answer for that. So I'm just before I go to you, I'm going to see if we can get an answer from that. From that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we're targeting the, the end of the year uh, with current staffing levels um, and budget snow um, on the horizon and global COVID situation, short two staff and much capability. That's that's the the shortest timeline that we can provide right now for a, for a new bylaw. The bylaw is being completely rewritten. It will look nothing like it currently sits. Um, it's been a number of decades since that one's been been looked at. So uh, there's there's a lot of issues that we're going to cover in that bylaw review with council, and uh, it will likely span a number of meetings. Um, and this is just one of the many issues that we're going to cover at that time. Councilor Thank you. Can we just not address this issue? Like, I mean, I understand that you want to do a complete bylaw revamp. You know, and I appreciate that because I agree it's probably long overdue, but we're talking this issue only. So can we do an amendment to a bylaw that doesn't exist? Or, you know, can we create a new bylaw and add it to the one you're talking about at the end of the year. You know, I don't think we need to wait a year, you know, at the end of the year. And I don't think that's fair to the customer either. You know, if we can come up with something that can address this situation and anyone in the future, so everybody's treated equally. You know, that's that's what I'm kind of shooting for. Dean? Madam Mayor, uh, yes, it's, uh, we can definitely put uh, a budget amendment in front of council uh, specific to this to this request or to this uh, payment option. Uh, it would entail uh, staff putting together a few different options for council, uh, bringing that forward, having council kind of go through the, the three or four or five different options that are put forward, uh, recommending one staff uh, that we would then take, uh, put forward a budget amendment that would, I, that would allow for this type of a payment plan uh, in our budget, uh, our current fees and charges budget. Um, and at the same time, uh, Mr. Storvold could be working on the, the new and improved and revised uh, budget that will replace this one. Um, so it is definitely doable. Um, from a timing perspective, I would defer to Mr. Storvold as to what his time period is like uh, to put those recommendations for to council or those scenarios, but uh, it can definitely be done outside of uh, a whole revamp. Oh, another question, Bob? And while we're doing that, will, if we're looking at this option for our customers, will we be looking at it also in public works? like for water hookups and that type of thing, that that can be paid on time? You know, like if we're going to offer one utility or we're going to offer all utilities, that can take advantage of this. It's just a question. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Barco and then Councillor Patton, you had another question? Uh, I think. No, uh, okay. sorry. Um, following Councillor Barco, you had another question? Um, uh, I, I did. Yeah. Councillor Van Elpen nailed exactly what I was going to ask, and that was about a bylaw amendment instead of waiting for a bylaw to be written. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Councillor Barclay. Um, I think Councillor Van Elpen might be getting ahead of himself, you know, supposing that we actually are uh, amenable to this suggestion. Um, when it came to me, and uh, there's a question, <laughs> um, I looked at it and I thought, well, you know, I think. If I was going to consider anything, I would say maybe we would finance anything over over fifty thousand, not up to fifty thousand. And the smaller amounts, you know, you gotta first pay the first fifty thousand right up front, and we'll finance anything over. But I seem to remember that's maybe how it used to be in Pinkerton. Did you have any information that they they had that sort of plan and then changed it to this up to fifty thousand? No, you don't. Okay. Do you remember? No. Uh, Okay, any other questions? Councillor Holmes. Well, my thinking was kind of along the same lines as Councillor Park was there. I think you want to encourage large customers. I, I, I don't think it's it's so much uh, looking at 
that the risk of being a bank is looking at the utility, especially the electricity utility as being a business, and, and it's a way to encourage business, and I think we want to do that. Um, and, and so the principal installments for lots of business companies, you know, like the whole car industry would collapse. If they didn't do that. So, so I, I think uh, you know, the principle I think, is a good one, but how how we can do it for, for this case, I don't know. But I don't know, but it's certainly something I'd be interested in in the future. Okay, so at this point, we need to give some direction to staff. Uh, Councillor Barkle, is there an alternative motion. of choice? Yeah, I was going to put forward mm -hmm. a motion that's maybe a little simpler than these ones, and just said uh, I move that the request from Judy Laundry for a um, waiver of interest and a deferral of uh, uh, and time payments for their electrical installation be denied. Okay, so that's uh, like number three, then? No, it isn't. Okay. Each one of them gives them something, so I think. We're not set up this way. If if um, well, I'll speak to it, but okay, basically the request denied. Yeah. Okay, it is number two. It is number two. Would you concur that it's number two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that refers to both. Is that the intention of the way that that was written, um, Dave? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. May, may I just ask for confirmation or clarification from, from Councillor Barkwell? Uh, there was no, during his motion, there was no mention of uh, either waiving or not waiving the administration charge. Oh. So if, if we can get some clarification on that as well, please. Thank you. The investment of property owners on dirty laundry vineyard to pay one third of the service costs. Up front with the remaining two thirds over 24 months with no interest and the waiver of administration charge be denied. So both of them be denied. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, Councillor Carlson, you're seconding. Thank you. Okay, so we have. Um, the second alternative on the floor now. Well, I think it is because both of them are denied, correct? The second yes. one allows for um, them to do the financing with no interest, um, but that the waiver be denied. And that's how you, I read it. That's how I read it. Okay. I, I'm not sure who wrote this, but maybe the person that wrote it, wrote it can talk to the intention of that second one, please. Madam Mayor, I can read the resolution, um, and rather than choosing one, two, or three, okay. just agree on the resolution, potentially, which is the combination, I believe. So that the request from the property owners of Dirty Laundry Vineyard Limited, 7311 Bisky Street, to pay one-third the service costs up front with the remaining two thirds paid monthly over 24 months with no interest calculated, and further that the waiver of the administrative charge be denied. So, denial of both. Oh. Right. That was your intention. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and great. Breaks, so. And that was your intention the second. Okay. Okay, now that we have that cleared up, any further discussion? Councillor Pat. Thank you, um, as you guys recall, as my colleague recalled, last council meeting, we, we have a 15% administration fee um, for water meters. And so, I, Dirty Laundry is a huge corporate partner of ours, and they're a huge terms of attraction. And I think that we need to take a look at this in a, from the light that um, they need to build their business. Their business builds. We recoup uh, some. Uh, there's financial impacts for us, and, and there's uh, uh, financial money's coming into the municipality. Thank you. 
male only. Um, I think that um, uh, that um, I would I would consider that uh, I I do agree that we don't have to give them free money. I do think that if we got as DCC start out at fifty thousand dollars, you don't get the thirds unless the DCCs are over fifty thousand fifty thousand dollars enough. And um, the reason that it does attract business to come in if they know that you have a plan in place where you can give a third and there is um, uh, the other two two thirds and DCCs of course come from irrevocable letters of credit. So you get the one payment at the, at the second and at the third year. So um, I do think that there's opportunities that you can look at and give a waiver of the 7%, which is somewhere in the vicinity of $8,000 for the administration fees to cut them some slack. I do agree that we should be looking at an amendment in the bylaw that uh, does allow us to move forward with some means of working with uh, with these companies, the uh, entities that want to come forward um, to do business in Summerland, and we don't chase them away. And uh, so for me, I would rather us look, take a hard look at how we can work with them instead of just denying it, where we we um, two three weeks ago now we um, gave a cut on fifteen percent, and today we're saying, oh no, one hundred and forty thousand, we're not going to give you the administrative costs. Um, I'll look at, it. and it was a far cry from the forty six hundred dollars for a water meter last year. Thank you. Um, Councillor Holmes, and then Ben Thank you. I, I, I hear what Councillor Cotton is saying. I, I think um, uh, you know, people hate being included in administrative charges. We've seen like that all the time sometimes. And, and I, I think when we when we review, review our fees and charges, we need to, to look at uh, you know what is what is fair in terms of having on administrative charges. I think it affects the expectation. Uh, by a lot of people that, that staff time is something that, that they should be paid through rates and taxes. And, uh, so I, I think that's something that has to be looked on to. And certainly when I read this report, my you know, like, thing popped into my head is how much staff time was needed to calculate the staff time that would be needed to do this. So, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, so I think that's something we need to look at. Just like I think when you look at the principal installments, uh, whether we can do it in time that's, that, that works for 30 months or not, I, I, I don't know, it seems difficult, but if we can, that'd be great. Uh, but, um, you know, that's where I'm uncertain. Officer Van Alphen. Well, I, I agree with the motion, but, you know, it all depends on how quick we can get a bylaw to the table. Like, I don't want to. I want them to be able to go forward with this, but we need a bylaw so it's fair to everyone that comes to the table. You know, we, you know, I just can't approve one and then create a bylaw later. You know, like I just think we need to get it to the table as quickly as possible so we can, you know, still work with these this customer and customers in the future. You know, um, that's where my dilemma is right now. Um, I think Councillor Barkley, you had your hand up before. Councillor Barkley and then Councillor Um I, I think that uh, I don't know where the debate will wind up if we want to review our bylaws and such and what appropriate levels for financing might be, but I just really don't like to deal and give a, a break to an art to an organization on an ad hoc basis like this, especially a, a um, um, profit-oriented organization. It's not like a uh, community organization. Uh, I, I think that uh, that organization should have absolutely no problems financing a $7,000, even 
administration fee or $150,000, a million and a half dollars worth of grapes turns into, I don't know how many million dollars worth of wine, you know, 50, 30 million dollars worth of wine. It's, um, we have our own cash flows problems, which uh, thank you, Mayor Boot, for pointing out. I just have forgotten that we're in fact, the corporation of the District of Summerland. I was really quite surprised when it was what $14 million worth of taxes hadn't been paid because of the deferral that we've allowed. And, and also, uh, I don't think our staff are set up to deal with you know, financing and payment processing and such on an ad hoc basis for an individual like this. Um, I think Councillor Holmes is quite right that a lot of industries, they do it, but it's a profit center for them, financing. And maybe that's what it should be for us. We're going to finance um, utility hookups over a certain amount. And, hey, here's our rate. And then our rate will include our cost it takes to administer such a program. But um, all those things are different questions as to this individual uh, application here. Thanks for training. I agree with Councilor Van Alpha not wanting to be fair to all the businesses, can't speak, businesses in Summerland. Um, I have a quick question. Have we ever been approached by any other businesses to do this before? A payment plan that we know of? Just off the top of your head, if you, if you can't think of Since I've been here, no. No, okay. Um, so there's not, there hasn't really been, no one else has come to the after this. Okay. Um, I have another question about it. It's in my mind. I um I would like to try to, to find a way to help them. Um, and you know if, if they're like they're, they're still gonna be paying us. We're not really giving them a break, we're just allowing them to pay more over time. And I think that if we charge some kind of interest rate, um you know, I think that, that would be fair and, until we can we can come up with a buy off, which obviously really needs to be done. But I, I would like to try to find a way to help them so I won't be supporting the motion. Thank you. Councillor Patton? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and this may be more of a question to our corporate officer. Um, when we're dealing, we already do it for DCCs. We already do the one third with the second and the third third. So in, in essence, we are financing those large developments through their ECC program by giving them the option with an irrevocable letter of credit coming in for the second and third. Perhaps if it's already in the Local Government Act in regards to the DCCs, could we not incorporate something similar that maybe we take away the 24 months, but it's a irrevocable letter of credit, credit for the second and then and the third third, um, where it's through their financial institution that they're getting the airbook letter of credit, and then that way we know we've got the guaranteed funds at the time when it comes due. And uh, we're, 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 only, we're only set up in, in, in that way. Thank you. Yeah, for Chairman, I mean, I'll just speak that DCC, um, uh, the legislation doesn't allow the electrical charges to be covered by DCC, so we couldn't uh, include the DCC. The payment program, for example, is something that uh, we could implement through the electrical bylaw. So the same philosophy to DCCs could be implemented through the electrical bylaw or the fees and charges bylaw. So that, that type of approach, if that's something council directors to look at, could certainly be something that we bring forward as part of that uh, bylaw review. Did you have anything to add, Karen? No, that's, that's what I uh, wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. But basically, it's a, it's a policy decision that council needs to make, and then all of those types of good questions that are coming up at the table will be in the bylaw. Um, yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree with you, Anthony. I, I do apologize if I, you, you thought that I was talking about the DCCs to cover. That wasn't the case at all. It was the program itself as far as the, the, the initial one-third, the second and third, second and third, third option. Thank you. Councillor Buffalo? Yeah, um, I think, uh, Councillor Patton is mixing apples and uh, cherries. Grapes. Um, <laughs> and grapes. Uh, juice and wine. Um, development cost charges uh, are for infrastructure that are off site. A developer still putting the pipes in the ground. 
for the putting on the water main, whatever, and all those things that he would need, transformers, unless he gets a break. <laughs> So you know, I think somebody had a good point earlier. If we're going to give a break on electrical utility installations, why are we not then finance the 200 meter water loop main in Trill Creek, that sort of thing, right? Where's the, you know, explain to me that difference. And development cost charges are also different in this and that they go into fund, which we will use sometime down in the future and they relate to the lobster. So all this is money we're going to be out of pocket right away. To pay that contractor, and uh, so we'll be carrying the cost. There would be no cost to us with the PCs. Am I correct uh, in that sort of interpretation? Yeah. Yes. Any further discussion on this? Personally, I, I wish this had, you know, I understand why it's before us today. But I wish we had had a better understanding of what it is that we're going to be faced in the budget discussions that are coming up starting next month. Um, because it's not, I, although I'd love to ask Dave right now, um, it really is not fair to ask what the extra impact of carrying this forward, even though it's being paid off monthly, might have on our kind of embattled um, budget as it stands right now, given the loss of revenue we've had. But anyways, um, if there are no other uh, points of discussion, I will uh, call the question. So, because we've talked a lot about it, if I could have you, um, corporate officer, just read the, the motion that's on the table again, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That the request from the property owners of Dirty Laundry Vineyard Limited, 7311 Fisk Street, to pay one third the service costs up front with the remaining two third paid monthly over 24 months with no interest calculated and waive the administrative charge be denied. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Councilor Train. So that carries. Thank you, that was a great discussion. Uh, okay, 7.3, 2020, here's another big discussion. 2020 Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program Grant Funding Opportunities, and this will come from um, Director of Finance, Mr. Svetlich. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the Canadian and uh, BC governments did uh, up to $206 million towards the second take of the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Uh, there are three stream funds uh, available for the second intake. Uh, the first one being the Rural and Northern Communities Infrastructure Program, funding of $58.7 million, uh, and the application deadlines are October 2nd. The Community Culture and Recreation Infrastructure Program, 100.6 million uh, with a deadline, uh, application deadline of October 1st. Those are the two uh, grant funds that we uh, we did submit applications under on uh, intake number one. Uh, and there's also a third uh, component, which is the green infrastructure, uh, which provides $47.39 million in funding with a deadline, uh, application deadline of November 12th. Uh, due to the time sensitive sensitivity of the application deadlines, uh, staff is seeking council direction to determine which capital projects the district should submit grant applications for under the Rural and Northern Communities Infrastructure Program, as well as the Community Culture and Recreation Infrastructure Program. The Green Infrastructure uh, Fund uh, will be brought uh, to council at a later date as the uh, application deadline is uh, a little bit later uh, in the middle of November. In reviewing the eligibility criteria for the Rural Northern Communities Infrastructure Program, uh, as well as the district's five capital plans, staff have identified four potential projects, uh, some of which do not meet the established criteria, but have been included in the report just for context. Uh, the projects are the electrical utility voltage conversion project, the Deer Ridge stormwater and sanitary sewer improvements, uh, the South Okanagan Food Hub, as well as Giants Head Road. 
I'll quickly I'll quickly try to summarize each of those projects uh, and, then, and then we'll move on. So the electrical utility voltage conversion project, uh, council may recall that under the first intake of this grant, uh, the district was unsuccessful in obtaining grant funding for this project. Uh, feedback received from the ministry was extremely positive, and it is staff's belief that we did not receive funding due to the submitted project, which was $7.3 million, uh, which was the largest application the ministry received uh, in the entire intake one. Uh, the application guide for intake number two does note that uh, applicants should be guided by the money requested by the shortlisted applicants in intake one. Uh, which on average was 2.07 million. So basically they're letting us know that uh, if you were applying for a grant, anything over 2.07 million uh, will not be looked at. The project itself uh, proposes a voltage conversion from eight kilovolts to 25 kilovolts, which would bring the utility in line with industry practice and would make the system nine times more efficient. Uh, this project also complements the Summerland Integrated Solar Project uh, which the ministry was extremely interested in. The Deer Ridge Stormwater and Sanitary Sewer Project. Um, yes, I, I'm not sure how you want to go through this. If you want to talk about the four for the rural yeah, northern and then ask questions, we'll ask questions of each of those. If we could, Madam Mayor. Yes, okay. So, Councillor Barkwell, if you could just hold your question. I, well, write it down then. <laughs> uh, are you making excuses? Because if you are, here's another pen. <laughs> okay. okay, please carry on, Dave. Thank you, Madam the, uh, the Deer Kitchen Stormwater and Sanitary Sewer Project. So the stormwater upgrades uh, would replace the existing dry well and overflow system which currently infiltrates stormwater directly into the ground. Uh, and it would replace it with a pipe system, which would capture stormwater and discharge it into Prairie Creek. The sanitary service extension would service the residential properties in the Deer Ridge area uh, and allow the existing septic fields to be decommissioned. The, uh, the estimated costs are $1.5 million for the stormwater upgrades and $3 million for the sanitary sewer extension. So $4.5 million uh, for both. The South Okanagan Food Hub Project, uh, as Council is, is aware, the district has supported the development of a business plan for the South Okanagan Food Hub uh, over recent years. The proposed business plan has been developed and is now waiting for the Ministry of Agriculture's Food Hub Network funding to become available in order to move this initiative forward. Uh, to date, the district's contribution to this project has been to facilitate its creation uh, with the intention to have the facility located in Summerland and run by a non-profit organization or taken over by the private sector. Uh, the ICIP program does require that the ultimate recipient will need to maintain ongoing operations and retain title and ownership of the asset for at least five years after substantial completion. Uh, therefore, this project under the proposed operating structure, be it an NPO or taken over by a private uh, in industry, uh, would not qualify for funding under this intake. Uh, and finally, the fourth and final project that uh, has been looked at is Giants Head Road. Uh, there's been much discussion about Giants Head Road uh, over the last few budget cycles, um, and Council has asked staff to look at different grant opportunities uh, when road projects are incorporated. Uh, the district's 2021 capital plan does include a budget of $7.5 million to reconstruct Giants Head Road, as well as providing water separation to homes along this road. Uh, as noted previously, the program does recommend that submissions in intake two uh, should not exceed the $2.07 million uh, budget. Uh, and furthermore, the criteria established for road projects were extremely specific in the guide, uh, and this project would not qualify for funding. So, of the four, uh, two would not qualify and, and two potentially could. So those are the four projects that were uh, are being submitted. And uh, if there's any questions now, our staff would be more than happy to try and answer. Um, before I go to you, Councillor Barkwell. 
Are there any projects that are not in these four or two kind of um, that council would like to see brought forward? Okay, Councilor Barkle. It's about the first one. You know that. Uh, um, the voltage conversion. If the rest of the world has gone that way, do they kind of expect us to finance that ourselves? You know, if, uh, everybody else has. Is it, is it kind of a lost cause there? So, you know, they keep that kind of attitude. And secondly, uh, I see you want to include broadband, which is part of the list of things they like. But I would think that broadband would only hurt our our application because broadband. It's for what they want to see is development in communities that don't have broadband. And that would be a higher priority over, you know, improving ours. So two questions there. Uh, Madam Mayor, when, when uh, we spoke with the, the grant funder, um, I believe that was close to two years ago when we, when we applied for the first round, um, they were very interested in the whole Project. They had no concerns that other utilities had already done their conversion and, and we hadn't. Um, because the voltage conversion project checks quite a number of boxes on the, uh, that, the grant, that the funders are looking for to, to qualify for this grant. The broadband portion is um, included only because that was just one more item that they we're looking for. Um, so just the, the ability to check sort of one more box there. Uh, we are in discovery phase for, for that program. Um, there are potentially benefits uh, to people who do not have broadband just outside of our boundary. So if we had a fiber system that was close to Boulder, that may be, um, that may help us with that grant application. But really the application focuses on voltage conversion as its core as a core part of the uh, application. Just to add to that, Madam Mayor, um, in looking at the el el eligible outcomes in the guide itself, there's uh, there's five core outcomes of, of the RNC program. Uh, the one that we're focusing on in this instance is more efficient and more reliable energy. Uh, however, the one right above it is improved broadband connectivity. So it, it does tie into one of the core elements of this uh, of this program. So we would be hitting two of the five as opposed to maybe just one of the five. Uh, you have a follow-up question? Uh, yeah. Yes, please. That, that, that's really my point. It's that it may check one of the boxes, but it would make us less eligible, really, to include cost for that because we would be a low priority for improved broadband. With compared to other communities who don't have any broadband, um, you know they'll say, "Oh, well, you don't need that." You know, even though imp improved broadband, well, my point is, is for people who don't have anything to begin with. There's so many communities in Canada. I was just looking into it for the meeting. There's like a million and a half people in, in Canada already that don't have broadband. I think that's more their priority than than us. But you know, that's you can make the argument that ticks a box too. I, I don't know. The other question though is is how did we go from two seven million to two million? Is it gonna do a quarter of the town or, or what's the story there? The first round application last year was for a substation and one feeder conversion. So the substation is sort of the first step and then you can, uh, it was for feeder six forty nine which runs up in Garden Valley and in the Prairie Valley. Um, part of Prairie. So the new application would be just for feeder 649 to replace transformation and, and make some structure changes on that feeder. Um, and the substation would come at a, at a later pace. So the uh, feeder 649 conversion was estimated at uh, just shy of 2 million. And we can we have to um, look at that estimate again. That's a planning level estimate, not a detailed design estimate. Uh, but try to grant first and then get into the detailed design. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Holmes. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you. That was sort of my question. So, so the the voltage conversion project uh, um, told me how, um, how how much do we see? How much did that hold you know, the whole town? And, and then how much would this? Uh, how much more would have to be done? Uh, if, if you can describe and, and if the idea to face the project. The entire project costs. Actually, Madam Mayor, I would like to bring back that number. Okay. Yeah, for the for the full project cost, I would just need to cross reference that report here, make sure that I'm getting that number correct. So this would be then considered uh, like the first phase. That's correct. And following on on uh, Councillor Holmes's question. Uh, there is 1.2 million in the budget right now. Is that is that what I read in here? It's what I wrote down, but that doesn't mean it's. <coughs> oh yeah, in the current five-year uh, capital budget. Okay, good. That's that's great. Thank you. The questions, Councillor Patton. Thank you, Madam Um At the two million dollars, um, if you. Were to do your meter six forty nine, um, and uh, and you didn't have a, 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 the, the station. Are we going to be seeing the benefits of the voltage conversion, or is it still at the at the mine voltage that we're seeing today um, because we don't have the uh, the station? Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Um, the Line voltage would stay at our legacy voltage of 8,000 volts. However, it would replace all of the transformers along the heater with um, a higher efficiency transformer, which is now our existing specification, which meets our CSA uh, efficiency level. So the old legacy transformers would be replaced. So we would see a benefit there. We would be heating the outside air as much as far as the transformers go. Um, and the, the nine times efficiency gain, that's from a true voltage conversion from going to a higher voltage. So that piece we wouldn't see until the, the substation's in place. But we would see improvements to the transformers themselves and their, their losses. And we would see improvements to our asset base because we would see structure replacements. So some of these um, wood poles would be replaced because of the clearances. So once you get into a higher voltage, you need further distances to phase to phase, phase to neutral, etc. So we need structures to get those clearances and that would renew those assets. So from an asset management perspective, major gains there. So in our in um, uh, in our uh, five year capital plan um, where we have one point two infrastructure upgrades um, that was for this same purpose is to upgrade transformers so uh, uh, would we be uh, it wouldn't be a fair question to ask people to this substation um, okay so so basically we're just saving ourselves uh, we'd still be moving forward with the 1.2 million in our five-year capital plan because we would have to uh, to keep converting the rest of the district until such time as a substation got built where then the voltage conversion would happen where we would be then saving some money. That's right. We just uh, replace uh, equipment through attrition and uh, just keeping in mind that this first initial grant application was for Summerland to build a substation. At some point, the substation that's already there, the forest substation, that transformer will need to be replaced. And if our system is ready for 25,000 volts, then we can ask them to replace that transformer with a 25,000 volt transformer instead of a 8,000 volt transformer. And that's just part of our agreement uh, with, with them. So it's so just about getting prepared for when that occurs and getting our system ready. Thank you. Councillor Barco. Um, how much longer, um, like how much life is in this transformer that you talked about replacing it? 
will an 8,000 volt transformer be available <coughs> or 20? I mean, are we going to be obliged at some point to go to 25,000 and then have to do a big changeover? Like, we have no choice. Madam Mayor, no, the Fortis could continue to rise at 8,000 volts, probably indefinitely. Okay. Yeah. Now, we would be their only customer at that voltage. And then they start to uh, potentially in the future replace their uh, mobile transformer fleet. And they may not be as inclined to keep one as spare for Summerland as their only customer. And then uh, again, as the industry moves further and further away from that voltage, there's fewer in stock. And we may, a number of decades from now, be in a situation where we don't have a spare. A spare is a number of months away. Uh, from procurement and so to move along with the industry is the best course of action as far as voltage goes. Uh, equipment also gets less expensive because the 25,000 volt material is common throughout Canada and we just buy it off the shelf as opposed to sort of buying from the small stock that are keeping from utilities that haven't completed it yet. Another problem. I, I see another problem here you know, I understand we're replacing transformers now with transformers that can go either 8 or 20, 24. But, it, you know, if we go down the road and, and all of a sudden all the transformers are now capable of 24,000 volts, we can't automatically then switch over, right? Because you have bigger poles, bigger separation. So there's a huge expense there, too. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. We're not we're not just replacing transformers with uh, dual transformers in preparation for a voltage conversion. We're also replacing structures. So every time we that's that's our that's our new um, distribution standard. It's at twenty five thousand volts. So anytime we replace a structure today, it's replaced at twenty five thousand volts. So all the spacing is there. Um, so of course that's just added planning and everything for our for our guys to get used to new standards, but. Um, when the, the day comes where all the transformers are replaced, there'll be very little to replace in terms of other infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Good. There how will long, be some. How long, how long does a transformer A pull mount transformer, we, as far as, as part of our asset management plan, we say that those last 60 years. And uh, we have some that are over 60 years. Um, and uh, uh, pad mount transformer, uh, we're saying 40 years, and that's um, that's consistent with the industry. Lots of studies on that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Patton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's still, still about the voltage conversion. No, it's about gear ridge. Now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know when we talked about uh, gear ridge and the sewer uh, going up to gear ridge, we, we had the $3 million uh, discussion then that three million dollars was going to be a parcel tax that was going to be uh, attributed to the parcels at the gear rate. Um, I guess this is to our, our director of finance. If we were to move forward with the 1.5 million uh, for the storm stormwater upgrade um, and the uh, excavation and the trenching for the stormwater was going in, would we not be able to incorporate um, the sewer up to Deer Ridge um, within the three million parcel tax that we were talking about going up there, so where we would only look at the one point five for Deer Ridge instead of the four point five? I can jump in. Yeah, please. Yeah, there's a large portion of the sewer alignment that's different than the storm alignment. So mm -hmm. from Cartwright Avenue up Taylor Place, across district lands, all the way up to uh, Morrow Avenue, is not within the Morrow Avenue road right of way, which is where the storm system will be installed. So those, the storm system in that section won't be the location where the sanitary main is, so there'll be no savings on funding one and having the trench open to put in the other for, that, for the majority of that storm project. Different routes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's different routes, but in in here, it's the estimate costs were um, three million for the sanitary sewer extension, but the sanitary sewer extension wouldn't be able to go where the stormwater was anyway. So, 
it's kind of led us in a different direction, thinking that the sanitary and the storm could be um, done under the same ground where they, they couldn't because they're totally different in regards to how they would be installed or located. Yeah, so there there is a portion once you get up to where Moore Avenue lies at the top of the hill where from that point on they, there could be common trenches and common work. Um, and then the, the entire cost of getting sanitary to the irrigation area and throughout is three million. Cost to install a stormwater system up or Avenue, basically to that wide intersection, is the 1.5. So, yeah, there's not there's not a lot of the, the storm infrastructure that's being proposed um, doesn't go beyond that wide. Um, I don't think at all. It's from that point south of the Prairie Valley and then to the creek across uh, through, the, through the lands. So yeah, there, if there are services that fall in line with the for storm sewer and for, and for sanitary sewer, um, but they're not yeah, to the same area, but not necessarily along the same alignment for much of it at all. Excellent, thank you. Councillor Barclay? Councillor Barclay, I'll continue. Um, of the three million for the for the sewer, would we be would we be able to recover any of that from the owners then that uh, hook up to the sewer system? That, like, I, I suppose we would be on the hook for the portion of the cost through the solar farm and stuff where there is no connections, but uh, all the other links, uh, there'd be a contribution from the homeowner. Yep, and that's what we discussed uh, when this was the, uh, brought forward during the solar site discussion. Um, you know, it could be a district or municipality led uh, local service uh, or local area improvement, which would then require 50% of the homeowners to in support of it, right? or there would be at least 50 percent that would have to defeat it. So we, we could initiate that local service improvement, and there would be a petition sent out to the to the property owners. To so would we do that before applying for the grant? I mean, how can we apply for the grant and then do it? And what if they say no? Right. And then what that, do do? if we were applying for the grant, we would apply for the full fund funding, assuming that we were paying for it all. And then, if we were to do it at this point, based on the information. As far as we can, I guess the rest of town didn't really have to pay you when they got there. It's 99. Yeah, if it was fully funded under under a grant, then there would be no need to go through a parcel mm -hmm. tax or a local area. Okay. Um, any other questions on the four? Well, I guess really two that um, are potential for the rural and northern. So is there, um, is it okay? Oh, Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you. Just a question. Any of our other sewer work that's done in the community has been a parcel tax. We've, the, the homeowner has had to contribute to the sewer infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, like, I agree, like, we should be initiating this survey ASAP with the residents of Deer Ridge and see if there is a 50% or better that want to participate because everybody else in the community has paid in the sewer. I think. Okay, before I go you to Council Barclay, um, I think that what we need to focus on is the matter that's actually before us, and that is which of these do we want to apply? The, the after part about who pays for what portion, that can come afterwards. We're applying for, at least this is my understanding, for the amount to cover um, you know, as much as we can, the 2.07 million. Is that correct? It's just that our maximum kind of one. Correct. That, based on everything I've read in, in, the, uh, in the documentation, 2.07 is the maximum uh, grant funding available. Okay. So the question, thank you for that. The question really is, um, out of these two that are eligible, which is the one that you want to put counts or you want 
to direct staff to put more time into in terms of um, putting an application forward. Is there, okay, um, I'm just gonna go to Councillor Holmes and then Councillor Carlson first, and then I'll come back to the site. Okay, so that's what you'd like to have filled in on the blank line there? Yeah. Is it, Could I ask a question though? Yeah, of uh, course. In terms of, so, so with the recommend, is there any, um, in terms of how much we apply for, I mean, we're saying we're going to max it up to 0.07, is, is there any, uh, do we have any, any intel on, on uh, you know, are we at a greater advantage? Do we ask for a little bit less or does it make no difference? We have no idea. In my in my conversations with the ministry, uh, they're they're not too forthcoming with with that type of information. Uh, they were pretty adamant though that uh, the two point zero seven is, is is kind of the max. So they they do make a comment, and it's also in the report where uh, looking at projects that that meet the the overall uh, I can't remember, uh, the, the overall benefit. To the community as a whole. So, mm -hmm. if if we were a, and I'm just speculating right now, um, if we were a, a two thousand person community, and we were looking at a four million dollar project as opposed to a twenty five thousand dollar community, and we were looking at a twenty five thousand dollar project where that would uh, where that balance would come in. Um, but to, to say one way or the other, counselor. Uh, they have not been overly forthcoming. Well, it's just 1.99. <laughs> Sounds nice to do. Um, do I have a seconder for the, thank you, Councillor Carlson. And then do you want to speak to that? Yes, okay. Um, so discussion on uh, electrical utility voltage conversion project being the grant application. Councillor Patton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, our plan is already to invest $1.2 million into the change in moving forward uh, for the change of the transform. So until such time as a substation that we can apply for a grant for the substation, we're already you know, going to that end means with our transformers. And I think that um, um, we should, I feel that we should look at a different project that we may have a better impact uh, for our citizens than the transformers, since we're already going down that road with our month with our fighter plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Barclay. Well, I, I can't really decide between the two of them without a little bit more information about the uh, about the, uh, the sewer plan. I think that uh, Councilor Van Alphen is correct. I mean, everybody pays a parcel tax on the on the um, the, uh, the current sewer system, and I would expect that the people in Deer Ridge and up Cartwright Avenue is it or um, the, the, the hill up the Taylor Place? Taylor Place, yeah, off of Cartwright, they would have to contribute something. So that would have to be really part of our budget, and saying, well, we've got a three million dollar project, but we expect our citizens to pay one million of that or something. Um, is but we really don't have that information. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, well, I was going to say, perhaps you. Yeah, and the other question I have, because that one can't be answered, <laughs> I think, uh, maybe comment on it, is um, that when you talk about the votes, it's going to be 90% more nine or nine times more efficient stuff. I mean, what are the real savings in dollars and cents here on the, you know increased efficiency? If it's half a percent more efficient, what does that mean to us in dollars and cents? Madam Mayor, I'd have to come back with that number uh, and look at our report. Um, but I, I will add one one other item that's benefited to the conversion, and it's um, that. On the Peachland side of the community, they're at 25 kV, and to connect there, we need to match that voltage at the distribution level. So um, it's it's all part of the, the long term plan, 
and there's 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 a lot of aspects to it that are that are good for the community. So um, it's it, it's a good option for us if, if we want to kind of incrementally start moving towards that. And this is a good first step. So we did try we did try this before. And so all of those reasons and perhaps more are you know, still valid. Yeah. Um, Councillor Holmes, you wanted to say something, uh, and then I'll go ahead. Yeah, just say the, the fact that uh, uh, this is something that we for the electricity uh, conversion, it's something we're going to have to do. Uh, and so if we get grant funding to do okay. it, uh, we do it. You know, uh, do some of it, then that's uh, we should. Take advantage of it, um, and if we have to do the phases, then we do the phases. And then uh, for the stormwater, I think we need to um, have a better idea of what it what is for actually you know, applying for it before we look for grant funding down there. I don't think it's further, I don't think we're as prepared for that. Thank you. Councillor Ben Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would have to go with bridge stormwater and sanitary sewer improvement. Um, I know there was some discussion about it during the solar discussions. Um, the stormwater situation there has been an, always a problem. Um, you know, there is people at this point in time where their septic systems are failing. So everything's built on bedrock up there pretty much. And it's something that as a community, I think we're, you know, we should take some responsibility in supplying them with a utility that, uh, you know, would improve that area, you know, immensely because for years, a lot of the farms below have suffered because of storm water and effluent or whatever it is. So I, I just think it's something that, you know, it's the green initiative and I think we should seriously look at it and tie that end of our community in sewer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeremy. Sorry, Madam Mayor, just to answer Councillor Barco's previous question, um, I don't have the dollar values here, but the Efficiency gains come to five percent savings in our ener energy. So we have to take the uh, energy consumption of the covered community and look at five percent of that. And then also uh, by owning our own substation, we get a uh, fifteen percent rate reduction at our wholesale cost. So um, it's a project that brings twenty percent uh, reduction in our energy costs, and uh, we will never have another project that would ever bring that to the electric utility. And those are huge savings that um, you never see. It, it sounds like something that, you know, I mean, obviously it has to be a benefit and the rest of the world has done it. And we, we have it. And uh, I think you should be able to do some cost benefit calculations which would suggest that we we should be doing it regardless of whether we got a grant. Uh, Five percent is, I mean, I guess what we, uh, that seems a bit ephemeral because we depend on the length of our lines and everything like that. Uh, Madam Mayor, as part of the work plan for the electric utility, a business case for this project was um, proposed for this year if we did not get the first round of the um, grant, um, but with the COVID changing everything we've done this year, it's been just one of the items we haven't gone to, but uh, we were going to do a business case on that. Okay. Councilor Pat. Thank you. Just for clarity, <laughs> um, we would not even, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see the benefit of the 9%, we wouldn't see the benefit of this 5% nor the 15% until the substation is constructed. That's correct, um, except for a portion of the 5%, we would see just from replacing the transformer itself. Thank you. Any 
further discussion or questions? So right the motion on the floor is to go with the uh, voltage conversion project for that grant funding. Council Barton. Just uh, in respect of whichever you know application we go with, um, the the information that the province publishes says uh, notes that the uh, requested average combined federal provincial grant was two two point zero seven uh, requests for large amounts are unlikely. So we heard that, but so I go along with Councilor Holmes and suggest that we make our grant not exactly two point zero seven <laughs> million. But some number that relates to actual costs, however, fall out a little bit above, a little bit below, but it sure seems artificial to apply for exactly the average amount that was previously granted. Okay, so uh, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? So that carries. So for this time around, it, it looks like the voltage conversion. Okay. So that's the first part of what we need to talk about. And uh, the second is the Community Culture and Recreation Fund. Back to you, Dave. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So in reviewing the, uh, the eligibility criteria for the, the CCRP program, as well as the district's five-year capital plans, uh, staff have identified five potential projects. Now, again, some of uh, which are not quite far enough along at this stage to warrant an application. However, we, we did want to make note of them in the, the report just so council was aware that uh, we, we were looking at as many projects as we could. With that being said, the five projects are the Summerland Aquatic and Fitness Center, uh, Outdoor Recreation Amenities, Giant's Head Mountain Trails Redevelopment, Phases 3 and 4, uh, waterfront beach improvements uh, and arts and cultural center upgrades. So the Summerland Aquatic and Fitness Center, uh, as council is aware, the community engagement and needs assessment process is currently underway uh, for the Summerland Community Recreation and Health Center project, uh, which does include the placement of the Summerland Aquatic and Fitness Center. As this project is still in the early planning stages and the actual facility scope, has not yet been confirmed. Uh, staff do feel it is a little premature to apply for this grant opportunity at this time. Uh, outdoor recreation amenities. Council has approved to invest uh, in three key projects to improve outdoor recreation amenities in Summerland for 2021. Uh, fence dog park at a cost of $48,000. Uh, tennis courts, $100,000. And pickleball court upgrades, $42,000. Uh, at the time of writing the report, staff uh, were awaiting confirmation from the ministry to determine if a package of the three projects uh, would be considered under this intake. Uh, we have recently discussed this uh, with ministry personnel, and uh, the ministry has noted that if all projects were in the same location, uh, the project would be viable. Uh, however, if the projects were spread around in various locations throughout the district, uh, they would consider each of those projects separately, and therefore uh, we would have to choose one of the three to actually put forward a, uh, a grant application. So uh, based on this new information, uh, staff do not recommend moving forward with this three-phase approach. Uh, Giant's Head Trail Redevelopment, phases three and four. Uh, as was noted earlier in the, uh, the council meeting today, uh, the district did recently commemorate uh, the completion of phases one and two of this project. The cost to complete phases three and four uh, is approximately 875,000. And now that's based off of 2018 estimates. Uh, additional components could be added, including additional First Nations interpretive signage, uh, as well as more split rail fencing and other measures to mitigate uh, users veering off the dedicated trail. Uh, should council wish to move forward with this project, it is recommended to get an updated costing estimate as uh, any cost overruns would be the full responsibility of the district uh, at 100% of our cost. So uh, having a, a good budget moving forward uh, is definitely key. Waterfront, 
waterfront and beach improvements. So the district has budgeted 35,000 for a waterfront concept plan in 2021. Uh, 10,000 of that is being funded uh, through UBCM. Now this plan will bring forth, uh, we hope will bring forth recommendations and potential capital projects uh, that will help shape our waterfront for future years. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that sufficient information can be gathered quickly enough to put forward a comprehensive plan that would meet the requirements of the grant program. Uh, so at this point in time, we are not recommending to move forward uh, with that uh, as there are no direct capital projects that have been linked to this plan. And uh, I think this is the final one. Yeah. The, the final one with the Arts and Cultural Center upgrades. So. The district did use its one application under intake one of this program to apply for this project and was ultimately unsuccessful back in 2018. Now, one of the requirements of the grant was that funds could not be spent until such time as funding decision was made. Um, and as council is aware, there were a significant delays in announcing uh, a funding decision, which uh, did put the project significantly behind in, uh, in construction. Now the combined project has been split in the 2020 budget where the museum now has been allocated $185,000 to replace the existing roof and HVAC units. And the arts and cultural project uh, has been budgeted at $383,675 uh, of which the district's share is 250 uh, with the remainder coming from there's a $20,000 Rick Hansen grant and uh, funding still allocated from the, the Arts Society as well from their gaming grant. So to limit additional delays to this project, staff are not recommending that an application be used on this project. And that concludes my report, Madam Mayor. Thank you. We'll start with Councillor Trainer. I have to answer one of my questions. The cap for this grant is 2.5 million. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, what um, were playgrounds considered at all as an option? Madam Mayor, uh, playgrounds were not considered. And I, there are, the manager of recreation is not here, so I can't actually tell you why they were not considered, but they were not considered. That, that was just one of my Questions. Would um, you like them considered? Um, well, I actually think my support would be behind them to bring the Giants Head Mount Trails development because um, I really feel like even though phases one and two are finished, I really feel like that mountain is not done yet. But there's stuff that still really needs to be done, like additional signage to keep people from going off the trails, and the work that's been done in phase one and two. Um, some of it I feel might be in jeopardy if we don't finish what we started there. So um, it would be nice to know why playgrounds weren't here, but I actually, I do think number three is our, our best bet for this grant application. That's it. Okay, does any, oh, counts for um, Mr. Svetlachny. Technology is a wonderful thing. I just got a, a message from our recreation manager. <laughs> And uh, we are waiting for the memorial master plan uh, prior to uh -huh. looking at any of the playgrounds. Okay, so that's why sense. they were considered. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cross. Um, just when it comes to the waterfront, you suggested there's no capital projects that are directly related. I'm just wondering, on the pier down at Rotary Beach, it says repairs are scheduled for 2020. I'm wondering if those repairs are happening or if that sign is being changed. Did you change the sign? The, the director of works is telling me that that's been amended to 2023. So we're not in a hurry now to fix the pier because it's not going to collapse. Any other thoughts or questions or on any of these? Uh, Councillor Holmes. Yeah, I agree with Councillor Trainer. I think we get our um, big bang for our buck with the uh, trail. And uh, if it uh, 
it takes as long as the last um, announcement to take, it's it's not going to send give a huge setback to, to uh, all the other projects that we have on the go. So I I, I would support the tax head on the trail. Uh, Councillor Carlson, yeah, just further to that, I think that in in COVID times, then perhaps projects that encourage being outside and uh, give that space will will be um, more likely, perhaps, to be successful because we don't necessarily want to develop build a whole bunch of things that people won't be able to use if this continues for too long. Smoke is summer, right? Um, Councilor Trenner, would you like to bring that forward as our preferred? And we can talk more about it? Yes, I will bring forward um, Giant's Head Mountain Trails Redevelopment Phases 3 and 4 as our preferred um, option for the Community Culture and Recreation Program grant. Thank you. Councilor Van Alphen, your second thing? Well, I'm in favor of this one as well. Um, it, it, as it turns out, of the five, it's the only one that I have a check mark beside, in, and that's in terms of the information that we were given by staff. The other ones don't really work so well. Um, I would love to see uh, phases three and four get done up there. There's so many people using that now, and um, we've received so many fantastic comments. It's just perfect, like you said, Councillor Carlson, in this time of the pandemic. I think it's, um, we're very lucky to have that so close to town and used so often. Councillor Barkle. Um, hopefully, if that plan doesn't already include it, uh, um, if we can add <coughs> weed, invasive weed remediation on any work done on the part. That is, that is a good point. And I know that there is a, a plan to do some weed management in the spring of next year, 2021. That's a very good point, Councilor Rockwell. Councilor Trina. Um, I just wanted to ask, that's a further question. We've got an email um, with a suggestion for a possible um, project from the Trail of Okanagan's group regarding a cycling um, path um, or painting cycling lines on the road. Um, I'm just wondering if that's something that could be considered under the green um, infrastructure grant, which I think are the last set of grants that are coming after the two we saw today. <coughs> we just got this letter yesterday um, from the group just identifying um, a pathway that they suggest it could be painted as a cycling. Well, it's stuff. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, stuff will definitely look into that. Um, based on what I see in the in the pat in their their guide, there are four outcomes that make a project eligible. So, increased capacity to manage renewable energy, increased access to clean energy transportation increased energy efficiency of buildings or increased generation of clean energy. So looking at that right off the top, this painting lines, uh, biking lines, uh, I don't know if that would qualify. Uh, it might be something maybe more suited for the uh, the one that BC always puts out, the, uh, the cycling, the the cycling bike, grant, bike BC one? grant, yeah. potentially. Um, we will definitely look at that and look at the the individual criteria within this grant um, to see if that actually does apply, but off the top, I, I'm not sure if it does. Okay. But we will look absolutely. Sure, okay, then we'll just put this letter on file and what uh, a grant opportunity comes from, from by PC that you should look at it then. You you received that, I think. I sent it, I think I sent it on to the two of you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, if there isn't any further discussion, we have zero seconds now to, uh, I'll call the question. Um, all in favor? And none opposed, thank you. Um, and then if I could just have someone bring the second part of that resolution forward, please. 
Councillor Holmes. Uh, the resolutions, <coughs> the resolutions for support of these projects be brought forward for council's consideration at this September 20, 2020 regular council. Thank you. Seconder. All in favor? No opposed. Thank you. Um. Um, so we're past the four o'clock time. Do we have anybody on the line? Because this is the last thing that we have to go through. We have no one registered, Madam Mayor. You could just ask the question. Uh, if there is anybody on the line. Okay. Is there anybody on the line waiting to speak to item nine, public or media comment period? Yeah. Oh, yes, there is. Please introduce yourself and state your address, and then away you go. Sorry, we have an echo happening this one moment. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's Michael Dyson again for La Vista. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we were not given a second chance to speak after the council did uh, have their discussion, and there was some misinformation floating around the room that we would like to correct. Um, please go ahead. Okay. Um, it was, uh, I believe it was uh, Council Member Trainer that was asking for some kind of a, uh, a plan for replanting of trees if the London Plain trees were removed. That plan was submitted to the municipal work yard. Uh, so I'm very surprised that it's not part of the package that's in front of you today. I think it was definitely. Uh, requested and it was given to municipal work. Uh, so we would like to uh, you know make a point of pointing that out that it is already there. Um, secondly, um, I believe it was uh, council member uh, Holmes that was making comments that the assessment report doesn't indicate damage when in fact it certainly does on page two. Uh, and if I can read from it, it says that uh, uh, these trees in a stress environment such as limited root space uh, will be more susceptible to an increase of annual dieback. So the tree does suffer by, by the, the lack of room to grow. Um, these trees were ones that were suggested by the district horticulturalist on the uh, replanting trees. Uh, so the horticulturalists have already met with two members of council to go over these different tree options. So, you know, from our perspective, uh, it's already been approved by them as to which trees are able to go back. Um, the one plain tree can grow up to 90 feet tall and it needs a 70 foot canopy. Uh, and it states in the report that most urban residential areas do not provide the room below for group and the subsequent concrete and asphalt heating, which will occur as the tree, as the tree matures. Sorry. And the summary on page two says that as the trees mature, root problems become obvious. Walkways become cracked and rise up, which the uh, sidewalks are doing. Uh, street buckle and even structural walls become compromised, which again in the report, the, uh, the wall is showing grass fractures and cracks. Uh, and uh, in this case, the conclusion for the removal prior to structural damage is a valid management choice based on the species of tree and the soil volume that is available there. So, you know, I do understand as we're listening here online and seeing you guys have made motions and defeated the removal of these trees based on information that is not fully readily to you, but we did provide some useful work. So we are hoping that you guys can reconsider this motion to remove the trees. Um, and to add a little bit more to um, Council Member Van Alpen, when he was uh, making comments that uh, the subscribe is willing to pay a sizable sum of money in order to help alleviate this damage and future damage, that approval is now within the year 2020. If we do not get the approval from you guys to remove these trees, we have lost our window of approval based on our previous ADM. 
So we basically have just over thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars sitting here waiting to do this, and we really hope we can reconsider um, the you know the, the proposal to remove these trees. Thank you for your if comment, you want to put back. Mr. Dyson. Thank you for your comments. You're well over the two minutes. Um, if I could just point out that it, it's it's process that you would not have the opportunity to speak again when council is having the discussion. I just wanted to point that out. I also wanted to mention that although we haven't seen the plans, we know that they were submitted to district staff because district staff uh, told us that they had the plans. And I think that maybe you, you misspoke um, accidentally, of course, uh, when you mentioned that two counselors have been over the plans with you, I think you meant two staff have been over the plans with you. And fourth, if you would like council to reconsider, you have 30 days to make that formal request. Are you there still? Yeah, we're here. Okay, so if you would like to make a formal request, you can send that request to the corporate officer uh, and we can reconsider this within 30 days. So you can make that and decision. Can I ask why that the three um, replacement trees were not part of the package? Because member or trainer was asking for that, which is completely reasonable, but it was already submitted. Well, I, all so I... That information should be in front of council today. Um, we're not going to debate this. Uh, but that would be, um, an, yeah, that's an operational matter. So that's why it didn't come to council because that wasn't what we were discussing. We were discussing um, exactly what you had asked for about the removal and replacement of the of the existing boulevard trees. So um, I'm sorry. Well, for, for, yeah. Forgive me for asking. But, you know. yeah. Madam Mayor, if, if you would like to continue to speak, we definitely can. Okay. Are, are you still there, Mr. Dyson? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, please, uh, again, Mr. Dyson, if you would like to have a reconsideration by council, please make that request to the corporate officer, corporate officer at summerland.ca. And you must do that so that it's reconsidered within 30 days. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, are there any other, I guess, is there anybody else on the line that would like to speak? Okay. So I'm going to ask uh, council to bring forward adjournment, please. Councillor Holmes and Councillor Van Alphen, all in favor? Thank you. So we're done. Um, now, we did have. Uh,